Welcome nerds, how are y'all? It's going to be another informative evening and let's just cut to it. I'm ready to get into the information. Uh, and then I'll have the part two of Tavistock uh, either tonight or tomorrow, probably tomorrow. So we did have a couple of super chats that came in uh, as I was ending the show last time. James Cotteridi says for $5, is there a modern Orthodox saint that you have an affinity for? For me, it is St. Porphyrios. Um, I don't know about modern ones. Maybe the ones that relate to North America. Uh, you know, St. John Maximovich or something. I don't know. I mean, I've been to his relics. So, that would be a good one, I guess. Um, people said he, has a, a, he had a temper. I don't think I have that much of a temper, but people think that I'm mean or something, so... I'm still debating on whether I'm actually mean or whether the people on the internet are just a bunch of wussies. I don't know. Mean is a little subjective too. Like, what exactly counts as mean? Jokes? Impressions? I don't know. Why is that mean? Meta Ninja's $5. What's up, bro? Hey, what's up? Meta Ninja's another $5. The last stream was lit. Hey, every stream up here is lit. When are the streams not lit? That's the challenge. The challenge is to go find the streams that are unlit. And if you want to support the show, you can via the Super Chat function. Super Chats over here are done through Streamlabs. That is the link for Streamlabs. Of course, we've been non-monetized for at least four five years now 2018 so we are not a monetized channel and that means we need you guys to help with liking sharing commenting and spreading this because the throttling is always going on now our buddy charlton heston over there who talks about damn dirty apes eating people the man who talks about uh soylent green is made of people well, turns out he did another documentary. He was so helpful and informative in our last documentary that we're going to go back to him again because turns out he did another talk on the KGB and the CIA. And this amazing, uh, I guess it's like a show, like a mini documentary. I don't know what these are, but... It's really informative and it goes into a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. So once again, we're going to see that mainline documentaries, mainline histories, talk about all the stuff that we talk about. And very rarely do we actually engage in conspiracy theorizing. Every now and then we might come up with a theory or speculate. And we always make it clear when we're speculating. Otherwise, we are usually pulling from actual academic literature historian uh, literature intelligence analysis literature etc etc so very little theorizing over here a lot more grounded than uh, pretty much everybody else thinks and then people find out oh actually they're really going really deep over here actually everything he's been saying is spot on yeah because i've actually read these books not everything but the books that we lecture through and talk about and cross-reference i've read so we're going to get into those tonight as we listen to Chuck Heston enlighten us. If you won't listen to me, listen to a Hollywood man. Let Hollywood man enlighten you on the history of intelligence agencies and the spy networks and how the world really works. This is called Inside the CIA. And uh, we will be pausing, as you know, and commenting, cross-referencing. I'm surrounded by stacks of books. Because I watched this today and I thought it would be a great topic again to cover with you guys. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's get into it. Soylent Green is made from Chuck Heston. By 1945, the world was tired of war. The Axis powers had been defeated and to a large extent destroyed. We need uh, Kate Blanchett to come in right here. The world is changing. I can feel it. 
Ooh. Like Lord of the Rings stuff. But as the victors divided the spoils, new conflicts emerged among former allies. At the heart of these disagreements were the fundamental differences between the Soviet Union and the United States. One was communist, the other capitalist. Now remember, we know that this is a dialectic, and this documentary isn't really going to go that deep, but it's going to give you guys a great introduction to the role of intelligence agencies. And you're going to notice uh, just from this, again, this very mainline Normie documentary, tons of amazing admissions. Tons of admissions of things that we talk about on a regular basis that give us an insight into how the world really works. And don't make the dumb normie mistake of thinking that well, that that was then. It don't work that way now. Uh, now it's just different. You just do you just do elections and you get the people running the country you from elections. <laughs> no, the world is still run and controlled. Not by politicians, but by people way more powerful, way more wealthy than goofball politicians who serve the moneyed oligarchs. And in fact, as we're going to show, the moneyed oligarchy is really who is steering the Cold War. Many, many texts, many, many things just demonstrate that. Of course, one of the ones that we recently lectured through, which is a classic for that, was Professor Anthony Sutton's Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. And none other than Zbigniew Brzezinski cites the works of Professor Anthony Sutton in his own defense of the coming technocratic era between two ages. So remember, the Cold War isn't just about dialectics. The Cold War allows the establishment of these security state secret shadow government entities. Those are the people really calling the shots not the elected leaders. Now, prior to the Cold War, we already had this power structure, but they're really setting up their operations, right? After World War I and the failure of the League of Nations, well, we need another global war. And then we need another uh, league, namely the United Nations. And this is all going to be run by intelligence operatives, think tanks, and shadow government. So this is going to explain to us how the Manichaean dialectics of the Cold War, and Tavistock actually studied Manichaeanism and occultism in depth, absolutely. The CIA went really deep into studying uh, the occult and Satanism, if you didn't know. This is part of where we get men who stare at goats and uh, First Earth Battalion and Stanford Research Institute and all that, remote viewing. That's part of that. That's where all that remote viewing stuff comes out, the interest in studying the occult by the intelligence agencies but uh, for now though we want to get into this basic idea of how is it that the national security state the true deep state comes to be well it comes to be via the cold war in the eastern system the interests of the state were preeminent the western system emphasized the rights of the individual neither side trusted the other Yet, neither side wanted a final confrontation. And so notice right away, you have the admission that Eastern Soviet bloc communism is focused on collectivism. Western capitalist revolutionary enlightenment philosophy of Ricardo, Smith, Locke, laissez-faire focused on individualism. These are both two sides of the coin of all revolutionary philosophy, as we know from Fire in the Minds of Men. It's a dialectical manipulation of do you want ind radical individualism and atomized individualism, or do you want collectivism, a imbalance of the one and the many in the social sphere? This sort of remained over Europe for many years after World War II, which was the belief by many military men that one day the Russians would suddenly make a move and head for the English Channel. This state of perpetual tension was called the Cold War. 
Now, in the second half of the 20th century, the United States and the Soviet Union set their intelligence services against each other in a secret and deadly game of global one-upsmanship. How many weapons did the other side have? What did they plan to do with them? Not knowing bred fear and anxiety. Not knowing drove each to build more and bigger weapons of mass destruction. The arms race. So the first element mentioned in the documentary is the push for the arms buildup. And this had to do with deception on the part of various agencies and the uh, Atomic Energy Commission and the United Nations, Bernard Baruch's plan for uh, policing and controlling nukes, supposedly. However, we find out that in Dr. Carol Quigley's monumental text, Tragedy and Hope, in the chapter on this, that this was actually based on deception. There was not a real concern that the Soviet Union was about to nuke the world or that they were about to invade Europe or that they were about to do whatever it was claimed they're going to do. This was all hyped up, but it was hyped up to change the stance, right, uh, of the West to a arms race. But really, this arms race is about building up and establishing a gigantic surveillance tech crypto cryptographic superstructure in my view and this is precisely where we get the internet from and that's why in the middle of the cold war brzezinski writes between two ages which is the coming technocratic era racing to be ready for the day when the other would show its hand and you can see the justification for this, right? And actually, Charlton Heston's going to even go into uh, how the justification for MK Ultra came out of the fact that, oh, well, the, you see the uh, other side, the commies are studying brainwashing techniques. And so if they're brainwashing uh, our good old boys on the front lines, then we got to do the same thing. And you see that the whole thing is this way. We got to do all this because they're doing it. The other side, oh, we got to do this because they're doing it. And this allows for a giant global managed conflict, right? Which on the ground level, there's real conflict, but it's a higher level managed thing that brings about an end goal of synthesis. All Hegelian dialectics, all esoteric dialectics is based on the emergent synthesis out of the existing oppositions. That's always the goal. And that's precisely what the third way position of Fabianism is geared towards. Intelligence became the world's most precious commodity. Intelligence gathering the world's most dangerous profession. For the United States, that job fell to the men and women of the Central Intelligence Agency. At the outset of World War II, the Soviet Union was the largest country on Earth, covering one-seventh of the planet's surface. By 1946, having absorbed territories previously held by Germany and Japan, the communist nation now controlled one-sixth of the planet. What is the real story of Japan? Now, this uh, emergence of the USSR, as we know from all of Sutton's writings, could not have occurred without the build-up aid and money that came from the industrial west in fact ford motor company built the gorky motor uh, the, the gorky uh, built gorky part as well as uh, many of the uh, industries basically built by uh, gifting and by uh, aid and so forth but this kind of begins to come to a halt when you get stalin rejecting the marshall plan aid and that's really the beginning of the cold war leaders had good reason to believe that the soviets wanted more only months after the Yalta Agreement, Premier Joseph Stalin had publicly declared that the world was too small to peacefully contain both communism and capitalism. War between the systems, the Russian dictator said, was inevitable. The United States brought World War II to an abrupt end with the atomic bomb. Western strategists now believed they at least held that trump card against Soviet aggression. 
then we also know that uh, according to Alex Abea uh, via his uh, official history of the Rand Corporation that much of mutually assured destruction destruction much of the uh, period that we're talking about was designed and planned out of the Rand Corporation in fact the former Trotskyites who had fled Stalinism took up refuge uh, in the Rand Corporation we're talking about people like Herman Kahn we're talking about people like uh, Irving Kristol the what father of William Kristol the, the fake neocon conservative this is why neoconservatives are so uh, such big fans of T-E-R-R-O-R their whole ethos comes out of Trotskyism their whole ethos comes out of uh, global T-E-R-R-O-R which is what the Cold War nuclear cl- conflict is based on and that's a strategy, not just out of RAN, but also designed by Tavistock. One week after Stalin's ominous prediction, a ring of Russian spies was caught stealing atomic secrets in Canada. The idea that the Russians might be close to building the bomb sent a shudder throughout the free world. On February 26th, 1946, George Kennan, an American diplomat in Moscow and longtime Soviet observer, sent a secret yet lengthy message to his superiors in the U.S. State Department. It's known as the Long Telegram. It described in considerable detail the uh, Russian system, where they came from, how they react, how they wanted to do business, and it jolted people. The 8,000-word message described America's former allies as a genuine and highly aggressive threat to the West. Now, this is covered very well in Wim Hof's book, The Long Telegram here by Keenan. And uh, this was a decision. It's a, This was actually a propaganda doctrine, uh, if I recall, according to Wim Hof, that was drawn up to cause the Cold War essentially to get this this uh, fear and this panic really hyped up um I, it's been some years since i really was reading this book a couple of years now we covered this book in detail but uh i did want to make well let's see yeah the long telegram here you go page 66 67 and he says And, and you can never get the freaking like trad cats you can never get them to understand this stuff it's just it's like talking to boomers so Keenan was a father of containment but we get this uh the long um telegram which warns us of the the coming subversion right and then we get the National Security Memorandum or National Security Council set up. There's a specific section in here that I was looking for, but I've got so many notes in this book that basically the, the notes don't even work anymore. <laughs> there's so many. There's so many notes, but there's something specific to this uh, telegram, but anyway that it's going to change from this is the it's part of propaganda so they're just trying to scare everybody to all is all it is soviet economic system was internally weak the message went on and therefore it was essential for their survival that they be an aggressor the soviet style communist system needed to acquire and exploit satellite countries in order to survive they could not and would not stop short of total world domination Cannon's message caused a sensation in Washington. President Harry Truman, his cabinet and military leaders all read the telegram. Truman was already concerned with Soviet expansionism and inclined to agree with Cannon's assessment. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans. With fantastic revolutionary era right through to the Second World War, if you're if the Western way of life was to survive, the Soviets would have to be contained. The United States, the president knew, was the only country in the world strong enough to stand up to Russia. But in order to do this, they would need to know how strong the Soviets were and be able to predict their next move. 
In 1945, with the war over, President Harry Truman had disbanded the United States Foreign Intelligence Service, the Office of Strategic Service. Yes, yeah, so uh, there's a great chapter. It's chapter 14 is what I was looking for in um, the Wim Hof book, uh, which is the economic explanations of the Cold War and the establishment of the Bretton Woods dollar system. Mass social changes uh, as a result of this system. I'm going to read just a little bit. He says, the required building up of economies of Europe and the third world, uh, if not also the uh soviet bloc uh well let me start over professor michael hudson explains in post-world war ii that the international economic system designed by the united states used laissez-faire uh, policies abroad <laughs> not uh, domestically to affect a concentric world economy revolving around the united states the currency was important to this plan this is known as the Bretton wood system in 1944 this agreement established the dollar as the world's reserve currency which is now beginning to no longer be the case this gave american banks the united states global uh, government power over industry reconstructing e economies in europe and the third world countries with developing economies there was however a dollar shortage in the world and thus to remedy that in a way the power the money the power of money could be exercised in the interest of banking thus the united states had to move from the status of a country with a trade surplus to with to one with a trade deficit this required building up the economies of Europe and the Third World and the Soviet bloc. In order to do that, this infrastructure had to be rebuilt, if not built for the first time. So this is why we start to see more building up of the Soviet bloc via Western industry and banking. In order to do that, the infrastructure had to be built for the first time. That both uh, required uh, consumption and consumer demand. This increase in consumption to the levels demand, deemed necessary by the American planners required a fundamental change of those societies. The fundamental change meant an alteration of the principles upon which those societies were built or based, which in turn could allow for the creation of the economic systems of Americanism in those countries, exported to those countries. To effect this change, American ideology was thus central. Henry Luce, C.D. Jackson, and many other American businessmen in the media and the government understood the relationship between society's organizing principles and their economics uh that was this was something that the american founding fathers also understood the cold war was prosecuted was prosecuted to strengthen the wealth power and influence of american private interests spreading americanism uh and thus to make this happen societies did not sufficiently allow for excuse me societies that did not allow for the american style of free enterprise were targeted for regime change Societies based around the principles, unlike America, were targeted uh, as well. So not just those, but also other perhaps uh, Arab and Middle Eastern countries as well. The major ostensible target was the Sovietism, which was a centrally managed state-run economy that lacked an interest-based system of consumer and business finance. So the idea that this is all really just about freeing people and giving them democracy is not the case. It's actually about usury and that doesn't mean that sovietism is a good thing it just means that if it's not having this mass gigantic usury based element then that's why it needs to change they're not introducing freedom so that uh you know uh, uh yuri down on the street can start his business no this is so that wall street can in a vampiric way uh suck the life out of russia which is what happened okay nothing to do with the poor russian people starting their own businesses the american business enterprise thus became a model for the world and thus the four freedoms right the four freedoms that we read about earlier in this book life magazine in 1944 made the connection between the societal organizing principles and economics and they called it quote capitalism by any other name it is the free market um blah 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 we're going to move on american life thus became centered around the dollar but what does this really mean for the world and this is this is a quote from let's see what this is from the second theme of american well this is this is the four freedoms right according to time magazine billings and loose in a strictly confidential memorandum to billings henry loose revealed the 
inner dynamic of American life and called it, uh, he named this theme as liberty and freedom defined as the ability to make all the money that one can in any damn well way you please. This included freedom as the sense of a political philosophy, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, which educated men understand. Ultimately, freedom has, quote unquote, many meanings, uh, but we remember them all in the American sense. Americans hate tyranny and slavery, uh, and thus money is viewed as the path out of tyranny and slavery. The second theme of American life is building. This theme I have described in the sense of a project. This requires the initiative of leadership of individualistic virtues and also a sense of cooperation. Anyway, uh, going on. The, ultimately, there must be some one world organization that will resemble the Constitution of the United States, which will then work to ensure free, free trade. Now, that's actually also in uh, von Hayek's book, Road to Serfdom, the last uh, chapter, the appendix is how we need a world government so that we can have a free market in the world which is ridiculous but because the world government doesn't serve or help the free market it's a scam henry luce's plan was uh tied constitutional governments with private investments we must proceed with vigor towards the universal agreement of human rights and human obligations again it's always cloaked in human rights neoliberalism the means by which this is done is the advancements of the rule of law the u.s must engage must encourage and promote constitutional government they say that but of course that's not really what they're what they're just establishing and promoting uh, u.s puppet states in all these countries not for freedom or not for free markets but in fact to serve the interest of uh, the corporate elite that run america and that's the same people that run tavistock so this is why all of this just translates into the exportation of the values of Tavistock, namely uh, rainbows and abrasions worldwide. Luce's principles influenced the U.S. government to set up National Security Council Memorandum 5501, formerly top secret. It is now declassified, and this is the uh, USA Business Global New World Order Memorandum. And I'll read it to you. NSC 5501, later named NSC 5602. The spiritual, moral, and material posture of the United States rests upon the established principles defended throughout history in this republic. The genius, strength, and promise of America are founded on the dedication to dignity, equality, and freedom. So just Masonic concepts. Generic. No, we don't know what that means. Under, quote, God. What God? The concepts of our institution nourish and maintain justice and the bulwark of a free society. Blah, blah, blah. The United States thus uh, is the preservation of this fundamental values and security. It's basically just saying that we have the um, duty to set up a global government to promote free markets. Thus, the, quote, capitalist principles. You see, this is all, it's not, that's not what this is. This is really about countries that have values and systems that are that don't place mammon as the as their god they need to be targeted and destroyed and he goes on to say that this includes then any country and they specifically mention catholic countries because catholic countries for example did not favor uh usury even still for example spain still was opposed to and did not like the idea of usury spain also uh did not have as its fundamental organizing principle americanism and uh free enterprise well all of that has to change you see and so for example aquinas wrote that the desire of wealth for its own sake as an ultimate end is sinful and thus uh usury is bad Right, and so that's obviously more amenable to a Spanish ideology of a life organizing principle that does not fit with the principles of Henry Luce, Time Magazine, the CIA, and the Rockefellers. They want private enterprise, aka which translates into them as oligarchs, 
and the ability to uh, destroy everybody with usury. Of course. Then it goes on to say that what kicks off then the Cold War is National Security Council memor uh, memorandum, I guess, 68. So this is where it really gets heated up. The emphasis on Europe being targeted during the Cold War for the free market gradually sifts into a decolonizing periphery where conditions are expanded or demanded uh, new and subtle propaganda methods. This means that Latin America and other Catholic countries must come to grips with Catholicism as a competing economic and political system that must go away. So the de-Catholicizing, for example, that you see post-Vatican II is actually a free market CIA operation. Well, an oligarchic monopoly capital operation, actually, to be clear. The ending of, and I'm not, I'm not a Roman Catholic, but you, you, I'm making this point because it's true, right? This meant that Latin Catholic countries, Latin American Catholic countries must basically dispense with the idea of Catholicism as an organizing principle. Now the organizing principle will be Americanism. This is discussed in National Security Council Memorandum 68, 1950, which uh, NSC 68 is a response to Sovietism. So you see the scam here. Oh, we got to do this because the Soviets are going to take over. And this is how, according to Wimoff, the Roman Catholic Church was duped into accepting Americanism and abandoning their Catholic social principles and the notion of confessional states. In order to encourage the flow of American capital by reducing the barriers and creating new markets, the Marshall Plan constructed and integrated European economies with when their governments were weak uh, so that they could not object to this. This, like other initiatives, was designed to repl replicate the American experiment by centralizing economic policy at the national level by permitting larger markets by eliminating the trade barriers. In other words, if there's trade barriers protecting the markets within Spain, you know, that goes away so that Coke and Pepsi can come into Spain. These laws are now removed this leads to then second the creation of the european common market this was of course designed by the fabian socialists as we read about in johan ratio's book who designed and set up the european common market the american elites and the cia and all these people working together with fabian socialists and then we get the marshall plan Right. Well, the European comment. And so Stalin sees this. This doesn't mean Stalin is a hero or good man, but it means that he sees this as a plan and thus he rejects this. This really kicks off the Cold War into uh, seriousness. And that's what's leading to the, the CIA then saying, ah, you see, Stalin is going to Stalin's opposing us. We're going to have to enter into this Cold War because he's going to build up his nukes and he's going to nuke everybody. This or OSS. Now, in the face of this new threat, Truman resurrected the idea of a civilian intelligence gathering agency. On July 25th, 19th... Uh, civilian intelligence gathering agency means private intelligence uh, army for the moneyed oligarchy. The Rockefeller family's private army. That's the description that uh, Servando Gonzalez gives the CIA. It's the description that we, F. William Ingdahl gives it. That's more accurate. <laughs> uh, worker bees for the banking elite. 47, he signed the National Security Act, creating the Central Intelligence Agency. The new agency was staffed almost entirely by veterans of the OSS. Uh, also staffed by consistent members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The first four directors would be military men. George Kennan's message had called for containment of Soviet aggression, but leadership at the new intelligence agency disagreed with that policy. The best defense they maintained was a strong offense. It was time to bring back some of the dirty tricks the OSS had developed in World War II. 
There were sort of two worlds of intelligence. One was intelligence gathering, traditional spies, people who meet you on park benches and, and try to steal documents. That was one side. The other side was covert action, which was much more aggressive, overthrowing a government, staging a coup d'etat. Regime change. Or it would be psychological warfare, uh, sending out disinformation. Covert action is riskier, there's a higher return. Once the Cold War starts, both sides realize that there's going to be a lot of back alley action. It's, it's going to shift away things happen. from containment to uh, more intense operations. Black ops is what they're saying. So containment is, is where the first stage, and then it moves out of containment into uh, more of these Black Ops and the CIA will follow the model of the British uh, SOE. So remember we had the Special Operations Executive that was the British sabotage uh, Black Ops stuff and that becomes the model for the BSC, the British uh, Security Coordinating Office, uh, William Stevenson and all that that sets up the OSS and then the CIA and then, they're, then the CIA is going to model their own version of that called the OPC that are not going to be on the front page of Pravda. This will be like the secret team. And in fact, that's where we're going to get the secret team, right? On June 18th, 1948, with the endorsement of President Truman. Market wizard Larry Benedict is one. Market wizard. So, yeah, I don't know why I'm getting market wizard ads. It was called the OPC. There we go. An autonomous. So here's what I was getting at, and then the here, the documentary is getting right to it. Branch of the CIA was born. It was called the OPC. Office of Policy Coordination was wonderfully benign name to throw people off the idea that really it was the Department of Dirty Tricks. Yeah, so it's just Black Ops, Dirty Tricks, so it's got this innocuous name. They were the covert operators. They were the hardball types who wanted to uh, jump behind enemy lines and get behind the Iron Curtain. The ultimate mission of the CIA and the OPC was to subvert the Russian hold on Eastern Europe. But in 1948, there were more immediate concerns. The Communist Party had built a strong presence in Italy, and the new agency feared the leftists might win the free elections. Here we go. Everything we've been lecturing on right here in this documentary. This is getting into the Gladio operation, and I don't think they name it, but that's what he's talking about. This is what we've been covering. This is when William Colby goes and sets up the connections with the Vatican Bank. He goes and meets with Pius XII. Uh, Pius XII. In fact, before he's the head of the CIA during the uh, Vietnam and running the Phoenix program, William Colby is setting up this uh, Vatican Bank operation where they're funneling the, the, the money, millions of dollars directly into the Vatican Bank, which then the Vatican is beholden to the CIA, which is exactly what Wim Hof's book is about, in part. So, again, Chuck, Chuck Heston, my ultimate vindication, Chuck Heston. Scheduled for that spring. It was perfectly reasonable for the United States to fear that Stalin might have a master plan in which he was going to use the Communist Party in Italy and the Communist Party in France to take over those two countries. He wasn't, but... Uh... Oh, he wasn't. See? Oh, so you see, the auspices for which uh, Operation Gladio comes to be is not true. In other words, fake intelligence. Have we ever had instances where... There's fake intelligence. Oh, you mean like every war, basically, right? Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, fake intelligence, right? The uh, the secret army is set up with Vatican uh, via Vatican uh, bank funding, via Opus Dei funding, via CIA money, using the P two lodges, Operation Gladio all based around what you just heard him and MI5, MI6 historian Christopher Andrews say, oh yeah, well, Stalin wasn't actually planning to do that. He wasn't planning to invade Europe. But they scared everybody into this 
And I'm not saying co- communism is good, but I'm saying that do you understand that this put everybody into the camp of serving ultimately not freedom, not liberty, but serving moneyed oligarchs. But the United States had no means of, of knowing it. The Italian communists were being financed from Moscow. Armed with cash, the CIA went to Italy determined to outspend the Russians. Armed with cash, that means William Colby going to the Vatican Bank. That's what that's talking about in, in code. In, in normie speak. Chuck Heston is giving you normie speak. Politicians, newspaper publishers, and election officials were bribed. Yeah, that's exactly what William Colby did. That This is why... So William Colby's running this in Italy. He's basically the CIA's guy in Italy at this point. And then he becomes... Uh, graduates to run the CIA and the whole debacle of the Vietnam War. The CIA-backed Christian Democrats won the election. It was a big win for the West. And- did you hear that? Christian Democrats backed by the CIA. Yeah, exactly. Everything we've been lecturing on in the Operation Gladio books. Soon led to more interventions in Europe. The CIA soon had a, a clandestine station in every country in the world. We soon had all kinds of foreign agents operating. We set- Now it's everywhere. You see this? Oh, you see now because of the Cold War. This is we got to set this up everywhere. But again, This is not serving all you normies out there. This is not for freedom. It's not for democracy. It's not so, uh, you know, Antonio can have his uh, little wine shop and his cheese shop or whatever Italians do. So he can have his gabagool shop. Okay, this is so that these countries can be under new masters under bankers dude under the fortune 100 and banks okay so it's like do you want to be under satan or lucifer right you want stalin or you want uh wall street and both of them are bad boys but it looks like nowadays it's 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 like it's even worse now because the fabian wall street elites are just unleashing total just hell right i'm talking about the fortune 100 who by the way will contract out to tavistock fortune 100 will say tavistock give us research on how to convince everybody of xyz that's how it works and tavistock draws up the papers and says here's how you brainwash everybody into accepting through your corporate baloney uh skittles and uh, changing your uh, bi- biology literally up various organizations, front groups, uh, to work with various peoples, indigenous, outcasts, exiles, providing them with money, inspiration, leadership, support. Uh, you mean like ISIS, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda, and ISIS are best friends. Al Qaeda and ISIS and the mustard gas is the best friends of America. You give you your, if you're either with us or with the terrorists, but we're with the terrorists, so that means you're with with us too. There were few limits on the OPC, but there was one basic restraint. Any and all operations were to be planned and conducted so that the responsibility for these actions could not be directly traced to the United States government. Yeah, uh, what have we talked about, right? Black ops, covert operations means that we just cloak our stuff uh, by it being done by some other group of goons, proxy warriors, patsies, mind-controlled dupes, idiots, right? What does Miles Copeland say? Miles Copeland says, uh, we love terror, terrorists. He says, because they're the most useful idiot dupes ever. They serve a great function, he says, in Game of Nations when he was running the CIA's operations in Syria and then Egypt under Nasser. So, yeah, nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with any of that. Now, Chuck Heston is giving a very normal watered down introduction but surely you guys in my audience are smart enough to put the pieces together to figure out that whoever that old goon was this old boomer here when he was saying that retired CIA staff officer and historian we we uh we hire and we work with the outcasts the people on the fringe he's talking about terrorists he's talking about the crazies of course 
What do you think? Various peoples, indigenous. Various peoples, indigenous. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> we work with outcasts and indigenous peoples. <laughs> The CIA soon had a, a clandestine station in every country in the world. We soon had all kinds of foreign agents operating. We set up various organizations, front groups, uh, to work. Wait, what? With front groups? What? With various peoples, indigenous. <laughs> he did. That old guy caught himself there, didn't he? People in the chat that were watching this yesterday, or that watched the last stream, there, uh, there was a, a series of boomers who must be new to the audience who were correcting me that these are not boomers and that I shouldn't talk about. This is just an old joke, man. I'm sorry you're new to this channel. You can't, you got, you're soft-hearted. You can't handle my jokes. And you get hurt when I, you think I'm calling everybody out. Uh, ease up, man. It's jokes. I've been making boomer jokes for 10 years. And I'm not going to stop either. So get used to it. Outcasts, exiles. Boomer is a mindset. And so to me, that is a boomer. Uh, I've met people younger than me that are boomers. So anyway, get with the jokes. Providing them with money, inspiration, leadership. Providing them with money and inspiration. Well, he's talking about fringe indigenous groups and fronts and shells. Providing them with money and inspiration. Okay. That's like that classic clip of Brzezinski when he's talking to the Mujahideen. And he goes, that is your country. God gave you that over there. Go get your country. Remember that? Is that the inspiration he's talking? <laughs> the inspiration, like Billy Graham. Oh, by the way, Billy Graham was uh, a, a, C, a 100% CIA promoted. I don't. I wouldn't say he's a CIA. I wouldn't say he's an asset, but he's definitely some level of CIA promoted person. And that's covered in uh, that's covered in the Wim Hof book, I think. Yeah, it's also covered in uh, Ingdahl's book. Because think about it. Isn't Billy Graham an excellent Cold War prop? Of course. In fact, the CIA even searched in the Cold War for a Muslim version of Billy Graham. Literally. Uh, but they couldn't ever find one that really worked. So that was a failed attempt. But let's see if this still, still comes up. Because... Uh, I can't spell today. I'm like suddenly forgot how to spell Brzezinski. So there's that old classic clip of CBS where Brzezinski's talking to the Mujahideen. They probably pulled that off uh, YouTube, but it used to be on here for years. Let's see if it's still there. Oh, here it is. Yeah, here you go. Check this out. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's... And isn't that uh, General Mahmoud right there? I think it is, isn't it? Without re because the CIA set up the Pakistani ISI, for those that don't know, right? The people don't even the people don't know this stuff. ...revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass... Now, wait a minute. Well, I thought it was against Al Qaeda. You understand that is the same. That's Al that's Al Qaeda, the base. Al Qaeda was against the Al Qaeda. You're either with us, you're either with us, or you're with the Al Qaeda. But they're also with us. He urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. So we know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail. Told you. <laughs> Brzezinski is over there talking to the, to the Taliban. That is your land. Go take it. And you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. <laughs> yeah, like he believes in God. I mean, come on. These poor villagers being manipulated by Z Big. Support. There were few limits on the OPC, but there was one basic restraint. 
any and all operations were to be planned and conducted so that the responsibility for these actions could not be directly traced to the United States government. It was imperative for the credibility of U.S. foreign policy that the President or the State Department be able to plausibly deny any knowledge of such actions. Plausible deniability is the underlying definition of a covert action. Covert really means plausibly deniable by the president. Plausible denial is probably better known as spinning. Their success in swaying the Italian elections left the CIA feeling optimistic. If a country could be prevented from turning communist, maybe an existing communist system could be overthrown. Well, they should be elated. Now they got freaking control over the Vatican. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge global influence, right? I mean, you're telling the Vatican what to do, uh, which is, that's not my argument. All you dumb trads out there that can't figure this out, go read Wim Hof's book, right? which is not even written with the same attitude and spirit of Paul Williams' book, and they come to the same conclusions. How do they come to the same conclusions? Because that's where the information and the objective research led. In the spring of 1949, the United States chose Albania for the CIA's first attempt at subversion behind the Iron Curtain. LPC got greedy and they thought that they could overthrow communism in Eastern Europe, so they hoped to stage a counter-revolution essentially. Well, of course, the communists were good at counter-subversion. They had very strong uh, state security, and they rolled it all up. It was a fiasco. Pretty much everybody we dropped behind enemy lines in Albania was captured and put on a show trial and shot. There was good reason for the efficiency of Albanian state security in rounding up the CIA-backed penetrators. They'd been tipped ahead of time in each case. The informant was a senior British intelligence official with close ties to the CIA. His name was Kim Philby. He'd been spying for the Soviets since the 1930s. Now this gets into the famous Cambridge spy uh, ring, which we've covered in detail. And according to the great research and translation of our buddy Mark Hackard, we have a pretty good uh, theory as to who the fifth man was, Lord Victor Rothschild. Now, I read some other things that go even deeper and it wasn't just a five man ring of uh, Skittles Soviet people. That's true. But it turns out that the uh, Lord V and uh, other British intelligence operatives that basically he had a stable of about 20 compromised uh, intelligence operatives so it wasn't five of them it was like 20 of them that were compromised and this is uh, it's not just Cambridge there's also the Oxford spy ring and nobody can figure this out and Peter Wright writes that famous book spy catcher and Lord Rothschild funds it and keeps misdirecting <laughs> misdirecting him because he knows who, what, he knows who all of the moles are and it's not five of them it's like 20 of them that are skittles and they're into really weird stuff and if you think that sounds crazy this is the model of jeff stein mcgeffrey before jeff stein mcgeffrey jeff stein mcgeffrey is modeled on this because robert maxwell is just copying the operation of lord v now that's a theory but i think that actually makes a lot of sense and multiple people by the way have come to that same thesis via uh, separate channels the by the way we've covered this uh, in multiple live streams we did a tinker taylor soldier spy so if you've watched the gary oldman tinker taylor soldier spy the uh, john le carre story it's based on this Albanian operation had been a cruel yet valuable lesson for the cia the Soviets were not to be underestimated, but neither was the OPC, and they were just getting started. By the way, now I don't know a lot about this period in Albania, so this is this is something I don't know much about, but I do know about the KLA 
And so that was a CIA operation. The CIA set up the KLA. Uh, NATO uses Al Qaeda and the KLA in the 1990s. In uh, okay, so I'm thinking of 90s. So I don't know this period in Albania, this Cold War period. But if you've read this, this is very insightful because here's a person from the establishment who, by the way, is a Royal Society researcher, Mark Curtis. Uh, I read this five. I, by the way, I lectured through this whole 400 page book in my members section, Secret Affairs. Did you know that uh, the KLA, this was a pretty crazy one, and it, this fits right into what that old guy was saying about making up these fake front groups? The Kosovo Liberation Army is a completely invented. T-E-R-R-O-R group that combines uh, Al-Qaeda ideology with Marxism. Can't make this up, right? And it's completely concocted. It's a totally made up, Western CIA created thing. Pretty wild, huh? But they were used uh, by NATO in the Balkans in the 1990s. In the British mainstream doc, uh, commentary, the 1999 NATO bombing against Slobodan Milosevic is a humanitarian intervention. Tony Blair uh, was praised for his defense of the Albanians in Kosovo, whose plight was... Now, by the way, did you remember, he's like an open Fabian Socialist, right? Blair, admittedly, part he's a member of the Fabian Socialist Society. So he and uh, Bill Clinton, uh, they're all proponents of the third wave which is the Cold War synthesis of Eastern communism mixed with Western capitalism. That's the overriding philosophy, you understand, of all of this, right? Klaus, technocracy, it's all the Fabian socialist third way synthesis. It's blending Eastern communism with Western capitalism, monopoly capitalism, not free market libertarian stuff. However, this is, this is wild. There's another critical aspect of this war that undermines this humanitarian emotive. Now, this is a Royal Society researcher. Okay, Mark Curtis is like official Royal Society researcher. So amazingly, sometimes you the, the, the mainline researchers and texts just put out the books that tell you everything. I remember when this book came out, I was like, I got to read that. And I read the whole book and I was like, what? How are they admitting everything in this book? So he says... British collusion with the KLA, which fought alongside with Al-Qaeda, acted as NATO's ground forces in Kosovo. The debate in the government and mainstream media circles declared, uh, during the war was whether NATO should put troops on the ground or whether Yugoslav forces should deal with it, blah, blah, blah. But what about the KLA itself? Much later in 2006, Gordon Brown said in his speech that meeting the terrorists uh, challenge was necessary at a speech he gave at Chatham House. The threat from Al-Qaeda did not begin on the 11th of the Big Nine event. Instead, uh, it begins with the uh, radical Muslims in Yugoslavia. Yeah, so he's talking about the KLA. The KLA was comprised of ethnic Albanians committed to securing independence for Kosovo and promoting greater Albania. It was a mix of radicalized youth movements and students, professionals and teachers and doctors, and local rogues. Uh, they debuted in 1996. Uh, let's see. It took an armed struggle to make its military debut in 1996 by bombing camps housing Serbian refugees from the wars in Croatia and Bosnia, and by attacking U Yugoslav government officials and police stations. By 1998, the KLA controlled parts of Kosovo and armed and organized around 30,000 fighters. From its inception, the KLA targeted Serbian and Albanian civilians. Okay, no surprise there. And in fact, as you can imagine, the KLA uh, received its money from running heroin. <laughs> That's the old uh, British intelligence, uh, opium and organized crime Sicilian mafia model of funding your operations and your black ops from heroin. The 
KLA was run by, or uh, one of the KLA units was run by Amon al Zawahiri's brother, Bin Laden's right hand man, Amon al Zawahiri. His brother was running some of these units. Now that's immediately sus because we all know who actually runs that, right? In my view, that's all British intelligence cooked up fake baloney stuff, right? Al Zawahiri, those guys, they're basically just uh, British actors wearing beards. KLA forces in Kosovo, Robin Cook stated. I read the report. So this leads to Wesley Clark. If you remember Wesley Clark's statement, the KLA proved uh, proved useful to the Anglo-American planners. Tony Blair stated a month into the bombing campaign that the KLA is having greater success on the ground than uh, blah, blah, blah. Described in media reports as NATO's eyes and ears on the ground, the KLA was using satellite telephones providing NATO with de- details of Serbian targets. Some of these communications equipment have been secretly handed over to the KLA by U.S. officers acting as ceasefire mon- monitors. Uh, together with the organization of security, the OSCE, Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, I think that's mentioned in Rati as one of those Fabian institutions too. They were essentially, in reality, just CIA agents. Of course, they gave the KLA U.S. military training. They gave them manuals, field advice, and it was reported that several KLA leaders had the mobile phone numbers of General Wesley Clark and NATO Command. Robin Cook, meanwhile, held a joint press conference with KLA representatives at the end of March and was in direct telephone contact with their commander in Kosovo, Hashim Taki. Um, with the war of years earlier, Britain and the U.S. allowed and facilitated British and other Muslims to travel to Kosovo, volunteering for them. Now, if you remember all the stuff with ISIS and Syria... It's the exact same way. They're doing the exact same thing. So what they were doing here with KLA in Kosovo, they do the exact same thing with ISIS in Syria. If you remember when they were trying to get rid of Assad in the, the last decade of the 2010s. Remember that? They were doing the exact same thing. Uh, let's see. B. Rahman notes that Pakistani militants associated with Harkat ul Mujahideen HUM, H-U-M, was a T-E-R-R-O-R group that fought in Bosnia and was sent to Kosovo via the CIA. Following the 2005 London B-O-M-B I-N-G-S, John Loftus claimed that MI6 worked with the militant organization Al-Muhajiron, the immigrants, to help funnel jihadists to Kosovo. Are you noticing a pattern here? Funneling jihadists to Kosovo. Funneling jihadists to Syria. al Mujahiron was founded in Saudi Arabia in 1983 by Omar Bakri Muhammad, who in 1986 fled to Britain. Loftus said in a U.S. television interview that al Mujahiron leaders all worked for MI6 in Kosovo and that British intelligence actually hired Al-Qaeda to help defend Islamic rights in Albania and Kosovo. Loftus noted that the CIA was funding the operation while British intelligence was doing the hiring and the recruiting. Uh, These claims were, John Loftus said, based on an interview given by Bakri himself to Al-Shark Al-Aswat, a London-based Arabic newspaper in 2001, October 16th. Bakri uh, denies Bakri later denied that he said this of course and then he gets into remember the remember back back in the 2000s remember Aswat if, you, if y'all kept up with all the big nine event then you remember Aswat John Loftus also claimed that one of the Britons recruited for uh, Kosovo operation by the Al Muhajirun was Harun Rashid Aswat, the British citizen of Indian origin who became Abu Hamza's assistant at the Finsbury Mosque, who would later crop up in the investigations surrounding the 2005 
London, B-O-M-B-I-N-G-S. According to Loftus, Oswat was a double agent working for British in Kosovo and for Al-Qaeda. Yeah, that's because Al-Qaeda is a tool of the West. Thus, according to the BBC documentary at this time, I don't know which documentary, but the Sharif spent weeks at a camp in Albania preparing for the jihad. This is this is a uh, figure who is Sharif, who is also connected to the 7-7. Seven, seven. So basically, they just took people from the 7-7 uh, seven, seven event and just trucked them over to uh, Kosovo. Or, excuse me, people from Kosovo were, were then later used in the 7-7 seven, seven event. That's what I'm trying to say. Because the Kosovo stuff's in the 90s, right? One Briton who can be more definitively linked to the Kosovo uh, operations is Omar Khan Sharif who in 2003 would become notorious for his attempt to ignite himself up in a uh, bar in Tel Aviv. He pulled out at the last moment, but his friend detonated a, a thing that killed three people. According to the BBC documentary, Omar Sharif spent weeks at a camp in Albania during the Kosovo Jihad. However, the documentary failed to mention that the covert British training camp was also taking place in Al Albania at the same time. Sharif had attended Al Muhajirun meetings in Britain and, and was an admirer of Abu Hamza, who became his mentor. He also met Mohammed Sadiq Khan, the 7 7 B O M B E R, who tried to recruit him to other jihad actions in 2001. Thus, U.S. covert support for the KLA guerrillas did not stop when NATO's Kosovo campaign stopped. So, in other words, they kept all their operatives and goons and just trucked them over to London for that event. That's pretty wild. Now, that's not me. That's a Royal Society researcher. Okay, so Royal Institute for International Affairs, Royal Society researcher. Mark Curtis writing a book about how Britain has for over a hundred years worked with radical Islam. Anyway, the last part of this says that the fall of Slobodan Milosevic uh, was crucial. The, the operation for him to fall, it was crucial that NATO fund and utilize these fake groups and these radical Muslims. And then later, uh, the KLA, or excuse me, let's see, who's the NLA? There's another one of these stupid groups. Other media reports that the European officials are furious that America has now had guerrilla armies in the, uh, in the sector to train smuggle arms and launch attacks across international borders and these were known then as the CIA's bastard army who were then allowed to run right in the region. By the way, didn't Robert Baer write a whole thing admitting that the CIA basically destroyed Serbia? Remember that? I remember that. Every now and then they write these weird admissions and it's like, why are you, why are you admitting this? Uh... What was that article? Was it Serbia? Somebody will remember this. Yes. Is it this one? Yes. <laughs> I can't believe I remember that. Robert Baer, former CIA agent. By the way, if you've not seen the movie, what's that? Syriana. That's based on Robert Baer's book, which again suggests that George Clooney making movies from Robert Baer books. I wonder who George Clooney works for. Uh, former CIA agent. They gave us millions to split up Yugoslavia. So here's Robert Baer telling you the same thing that he's saying. Baer claims that he and colleagues received millions of dollars to cause 
the splitting up of Yugoslavia. Duh. We bribe parties, politicians, encourage hatred. Encourage hatred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. Uh, he doesn't mention. He's not going to mention anything about KLA and all this stuff. But it's the same stuff, right? And this is just uh, CIA operations in the Balkans. The aim of propaganda was split up Yugoslavia. He emphasized that those who cause the war today are the owners of the companies that are using the natural resources of former. So here you have it. The guy, the people that run it tell you why they're doing it. Oh, I thought it was for humanitarian. No, it's for corporations, dummy. And he goes on CNN all the time, so he's total system person. Of interest from the perspective of the British foreign policy was that in March of 2001, the guerrillas began another war. So there was another war began in 2001. This time, across the nearby border, and the war was with Macedonia. It was led by several commanders previously trained by British forces for the Kosovo campaign. Now they fought under the banner of what they called the National Liberation Army. Anytime you see anything named something like that, you know it's, you know, it's a cutout group. Uh, the NLA was formed in 2001. Two of the Kosovo-based commanders of this push into Macedonia. So this becomes a uh, base to do operations against Macedonia. And ultimately, this just relates to uh, reducing the influence and sphere of Russia. Um, this is, by the way, why they tried the same church split like they did in Ukraine to split the Orthodox Church in Macedonia and Montenegro. Uh, am I right about that? In there, an attempt to split the church in Macedonia too. My, re- I'm just going from memory here. By the way, Robert Baer in his book, he's got a whole chapter on Macedonia, so he was probably running these operations in Macedonia too. And in Georgia, he has a chapter on Georgia. Remember all the 2008 Ossetia, Saakashvili stuff. Who was a Western operative? That's all part of this stuff too. Uh, let's see, Macedonia. Yep. Here's Radio Free Europe, the CIA's uh, propaganda outlet. Yep, I was right. Macedonians, uh, so of course, Bartholomew wants to split there as well. So yeah, same operation. Do you see it? It's just, how come people can't figure this out? It's the same stuff every time. You see that? The Fanar continues to split orthodoxy. So yeah, Bartholomew is going to run the same operation in Macedonia. I was right. Anyway, so the NLA, it says, another NLA commander was Gassim Ostremi, who had previously been trained by the British SAS to head up a UN-sponsored Kosovo Protection Corps, which was meant to replace the KLA. The NLA force was now being called terrorists by Foreign Secretary Robin Cook and murderous thugs by NATO Secretary Lord Robertson. just as they had been before the 1990 bombing campaign when the British were cooperating with them. So here's the pattern. You train and fund the radicals. They do what they're supposed to do. Then they become useful terrorists for uh, international media when you need to use the terrorists. You see how this works? Train, fund Mujahideen. Then the Mujahideen become the villains in 1993. Right? Taliban, Al-Qaeda, World Trade Center bombing 1993. Then they're the villains again uh, in the Big Nine event. I mean, this is, it's not hard. I don't, why can people not figure this out? Robert Baer tells you what they do, and people can't figure this out. Call, they call you a conspiracy theorist when you read them Robert Baer articles. All right, let's get back to, we, we want to, on a, Kosovo deep dive because people don't know about Kosovo. Now, I don't know about Albania and the Cold War. This is something I don't know about.
By 1950, the CIA and its new operations arm, the OPC, realized they were at a distinct disadvantage when it came to clandestine warfare. For one thing, the Russians had been at it longer. They'd been spying on the world and each other since the Tsars had been in power. The KGB had the backing of a totalitarian state and was extremely powerful and was well known to the people. I mean, it had a secret police arm. KGB guy can grab you in the street and you might not be heard from for a long time, if ever. CIA has no... This mistake is costing Amazon Prime shoppers. Thank you, Entrepreneur Boomer. We don't want to drop ship anything from Amazon. No, we're not interested. Enforcement powers. Never has, never will. The KGB win, in my opinion, because they developed more good spies operating in the United States than the United States developed good spies operating behind the Iron Curve. This is the Directorate as Illegals program, which is what the TV show The Americans is about, which we've done uh, many, many, many podcasts with Mark Hackard about. So you can go catch up on all that in the archives. Uh, by the way, I want to remind you guys too that I do have my philosophy course, which is forever out there for sale. You can always purchase the philosophy course, which is the full history of Western philosophy. Uh, right there, the link in the show description, the Autonomy Agora Marketplace with our uh, sponsor over there, Richard Grove. Shout out to Richard Grove and Tragedy and Hope. Just a little reminder that you can purchase the full philosophy course at all times. It was easier to keep secrets in a closed society, and it was much more difficult to spy in a country when access to that country was controlled and everyone in it was being watched. The communists helped get themselves in power by subversion, so they were good at it. They knew how to do... Think about this for a second, right? Because this documentary is set, you know, with this Cold War mindset. And, oh, the KGB are the bad guys because they want to surveil everybody at all times. Oh, you mean the people now who control everybody and want to surveil everybody at all times are still the good guys? So, wait a minute. If it's bad for the KGB to send secret police to follow you around and spy on you? Is it bad when Gil Bates and Klaus and all the tech gurus and overlords want to spy on me at all times and control and the NSA wants to control and spy on me? Is that bad or is that good now? I'm confused. Because you're saying it's bad when the KGB in this limited sense did it. When the Stasi man follows you around town, it's bad. Oh, but if... Uh, Mark Zuckerberg wants to spy on you at all times. Is that good now? Please help me understand this. Uh, sting operations and to spy and to run covert operations. And the, the KGB was really better than we were, at least at the outset. And they were very good at sucking us in, making us think that we were having a success, uh, drawing us in and then slamming the door on our hands. Ground zero in the Cold War was the occupied city of Berlin. The line that divided the Russian-held sector from that of England, France, and the United States marked the figurative border between East and West, between the free world and the authoritarian world. There were literally thousands of Soviet and East German state security agents in Berlin, enough to watch every man, woman, and child who lived there. The CIA operatives had a nickname for the former German capital. They called it Kidnap Town. It was wild and woolly. It was the Wild West. The Soviets would try to kidnap our agents, and this guy would be walking down the street, and a car would come uh, along and just pull him into the car, and he would disappear. So we actually covered uh, a couple movies that are basically premised on this idea. If you, think all of this if you about, didn't see... Uh, you know, the live streams that we did or my live streams on man nobody knew which is the documentary colby uh the courier which is uh benedict cucumber batch and the spy who came in from the cold the lacare novel that is the richard burton movie uh which is really good but nobody watched this live stream nobody found this to be interesting and that yet i'm here telling you that none of you can understand what is going on in the world if you don't understand these things?
This is huge piece of the puzzle. And if you don't get this, you don't know anything. And you won't be able to understand anything that's going on. And no one should listen to you until you know these things. So if you haven't watched those movies, I recommend watching them. Because, by the way, The Courier is about Oleg Pinkovsky, the defector. Uh, and that will be he will be mentioned in this documentary, actually. So let's, see, let's get back to the documentary. Here, there was an unwritten agreement that they didn't kidnap Americans. They mostly take our clients, Eastern Europeans who are working for us or Germans who are working for us. There were other rules of procedure in this deadly game of cat and mouse, of tit for tat. Arrest one of their spies and they took one of yours. Captured spies were not prosecuted, but instead exchanged. These exchanges usually took place on a bridge like the Glanicky, which spanned the Spray River. It marked the border between East and West Berlin. Assassination was not an option because retaliation was sure to come in kind. You're much better off knowing who the top agent is than to shoot him and get rid of him. Who will, who will replace him? You don't know who the replacement is. You've identified that agent. You're that much ahead of the game. Then you try to see if you can double that agent back. You begin to try to feed him information or open contact with him. In other words, this is the game. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, this is also why you have embassies, right? I mean, everybody knows that the people in the embassies are all spies. Uh, and every nation knows that the other nations are going to engage in spying, so you might as well have known spying and, and people at the embassies. So that's why embassies are full of spies. Actually, we had sort of a tacit agreement not to kill each other, you know, not to murder each other. We met the CIA people all the time. I myself did it a lot of time, but mainly with the purpose to, well, to find out what sort of a man he is, whether he is recruitable or non-recruitable, and so on. But it's, well, it's a normal procedure for spying. In September 1949, CIA and U.S. Air Force scientists detected the presence of a radioactive cloud over the North Pacific, which indicated that the Russians had detonated an atomic device somewhere on the mainland of Asia. Now the Russians, too, had the ultimate weapon of terror. Would they use it? And if they did, how and where would they use it? At the annual May Day Parade in Moscow in 1948, the Soviets had unveiled a new bomber, the... Here we go, the ramping up, right? Uh-oh, they got a zillion nukes. Uh-oh, it's time to go into hardcore Cold War mode. Was there a gap? Did the Russians have more bombers and atomic bombs than the Americans? Well, uh, no, by the way, but they're going to say yes because they wanted to scare the crap out of everybody. The CIA searched for answers. The United States stepped up the pace in the arms race. In 1953, Dwight Eisenhower came. By the way, this is mentioned, again, in that chapter in Tragic and Hope. What an excellent chapter. The nuclear rivalry chapter. <clears throat> and that's the chapter, by the way, where he, he talks about the bankers bringing Tiny Mustache Man into power. Uh, but... The UN Security Council is uh, the, Maca uh, the McMahon bill set up the Atomic Energy Commission. It functioned as a disappointment to the BAS scientists. They had sought freedom from military influence and reduced influence from the uh, reduced emphasis on the military uses of nuclear fission, free dissemination of theoretical research, blah blah blah. They failed on all these points. The AEC operated largely in terms of weapons research and production it remained extravagantly secret and then he says that 
inevitably it was dominated by a scientific advisory committee of official scientists like Oppenheimer, although Oppenheimer was not actually an official scientist. Get this. State Department committee led by Undersecretary Dean Acheson and David Lilenthal uh, and a second committee led by Bernard Baruch, the banker, spent much of 1946 trying to work out a system of international control of nukes. The task was educate, uh, of educating non-science people fell on Oppenheimer, who gave dozens of brilliant extemporaneous chalk dust lectures on nukes. The final plan was presented to the UN by Banker Baruch in ni- June of 46, provided international control bodily body similar to the AEC. That's what I was just talking about earlier. This gives rise to the UN Security Council, but this is all exaggerated. And by the way, he says that the US aided Tito, by the way. Why would the US aid Tito? Uh, If I recall, there was this you don't believe me let me show you you don't believe me i'll show you because people never believe these things they think it's all made up conspiracy theories when it's actual history it's all conspiracy theories conspiracy theories they the tears all right can you read that the stupid thing That's the Truman Doctrine. Here you go. Right there. See that? So the global threat of nukes leads to the global policing of the Security Council. It's a scam for world... It's just control. That's all it's about. And then it goes into talking about the exaggeration of the Soviet threat. Quigley does in Treasuring Hope in those chapters. If you have it, it's like page one. Just go read it yourself. Page uh, 8, 94, 95, 9. And that's where he starts talking about the U.S. aiding Tito. Presumably, they they thought they could turn him against Stalin, I guess. But uh, that perfectly ties into what the documentary is covering so I thought I would throw that in into the American presidency with a pledge to end the Korean War he brought with him a new enthusiasm and respect for clandestine warfare once he'd negotiated a truce in America's last remaining hot war he set out to fight the Cold War these are those Ah. raw crystals in your oh We don't need no crystals in our head, Gaia. It's only with the the election of Dwight D. Eisenhower that covert action becomes simply the main activity of the CIA. Now, Truman had been won over it bit by bit, but he would go so far and no further. Eisenhower was fascinated by covert action. He was impressed by what OSS had done for him and helped him in Europe during the war. And he thought this was a technique that could be more widely applied. And uh, <laughs> well, by the way, uh, his military industrial complex speech is he's referring to Tavistock in that speech, right? He's talking about the people behind the scenes that can run this military industrial complex and basically take over everything. Uh, that's talking about Tavistock and, uh, and the, the technocrats. He distrusted the use of the army. He didn't want to get into that being a general himself. So he turned the CIA into a private presidential army. While Harry Truman had authorized covert action against the Soviet bloc, Korea, and Southeast Asia, Eisenhower saw opportunities for covert action wherever American interests were at stake. And the former Supreme Allied commander especially appreciated the concept of plausible deniability. Eisenhower appointed Alan Dulles, ex-OSS spymaster, as the new director of... 
and Council on Foreign Relations. Right. So here we go again with uh, all the old same old goons. Central intelligence. The two men endorsed covert action as by far the lesser of two evils. Neither man had any desire to fight another hot war, but both were looking to score a win against the Soviets in the Cold One. Since the 1930s, much of the Western world depended on Iran. What this music? It's like I'm playing Final Fantasy or something. I feel like I'm like need to restore my hit points with this harp music. As their oil supplier, the Shahs had an agreement with a British oil company, which paid them. Oh, now we're gonna get into Operation Ajax, right? Uh, the overthrow of the of Mosaddegh and the installment of the CIA puppet of the Shah. And that's all for the uh, Anglo-Iranian oil company. So if you didn't know that, British Petroleum used to be called the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And it comes from this. Then in 1951, a nationalist named Mohammad Mosaddegh came to power, undercutting the weak Shah. Mossadegh nationalized the British oil holdings, turned a cold shoulder to the Shah's Western allies, and began to court favor with Russia. The United States, at risk of losing influence in the Middle East, turned to the CIA. Kermit Roosevelt, grandson to Teddy, was the CIA's best Middle Eastern operative. Yes, and he runs Operation Ajax, which engages in this regime change. He had himself smuggled into the palace in Tehran, where he met secretly with Reza Pahlavi, the young Shah. Roosevelt tried to convince the Shah to denounce Mossadegh before the Iranian National Assembly. Pahlavi agreed, but shortly afterward, rioting broke out in the streets, and the Shah fled to Rome. Roosevelt said the Shah is a wimp, but he still had a plan left. He paid $10,000 to some street toughs and circus muscle men to stage a riot favoring the Shah. To everyone's surprise, the riot escalated and Mossadegh was forced to relinquish his power. The Shah returned to rule as a strong ally of the Western influences that had given him back his throne. This has nothing to do with stupid tradition of uh, having a Persian, you know, Cyrus for you dummies out there. This is all this is is to for oil. <laughs> this is a coup for BP, okay, for the Queen and for uh, who's the other monarch that has a bunch of Dutch royal shell and all those the Seven Sisters oil, this kind of a thing. That's what's the background of this. Nothing to do with traditionalism. So. All the dummies and the people who don't understand what's really going on, they think this is over their ideologies. No, it's over the control of oil. The CIA's success in Iran brought elation to Washington. And why is the CIA overthrowing these countries? Oil. Standard oil. BP. Shell. Dutch Royal Shell. Do you understand? Can we figure this out? Who do the spies work for? Do they work for the Constitution, for liberty and freedom and justice? No, they work for the oil companies, dummy. Restoring the Shah through covert means had been relatively easy. The By the way, if you didn't hear the analysis that Freddie Ponton gave of the Ukraine situation, it was great because he got deep into the energy sector as a big backdrop for Ukraine. And nobody's talking about this. But everybody could see that, hey, wait a minute, there was a there was a window into this that everybody in the world could see a few weeks ago with the Nerd Stream pipeline. The Nerd Stream pipeline was a window for everybody to see, hey, wait a minute. This is about energy control, isn't it? So if you go listen to this talk and thankfully, I didn't uh, leave this talk until Freddie Ponton gave his talk. And so his analysis is at the end of that. He comes on about the last, I don't know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Let's see when he comes on. First of all, 
taking it into the context of a uh, of a, the digitalization uh, revolution uh, we all went through. So I think for me, what's very important is to put propaganda in the context uh, of a digitalized world. And uh, if you're going to put propaganda in the context of a this is it. So if you go to about one thirty six, he comes on to the last chunk. And he's going to give you a complete breakdown of the energy control as the background to Ukraine. And it lines up perfectly with what is in F. William Ingdahl's book on the energy sector. Going all the way back to the Georgia Ossetia crisis. The color revolutions are about pipelines. So in Full Spectrum Dominance by Engdahl, see that? Look at that. Same thing going on right now. It's the exact same. No different. These conflicts are about energy control, resource control. So if you have full spectrum dominance, go reread page 41, 42, 43, 44, uh, up to 60, because it's about the energy corridor, the Russian energy corridor. That's up, up to page 61. And that's exactly what he talks about here about the Ukraine. Fifth generation war basically uh, their warfare systems they're looking at uh, how do we control how do we get more control or how we stop nations getting more control uh, on other nations and in that debate and in that brainstorming they obviously the topic of energy uh, became very important and very quickly we, we saw these big nations at like russia china and the united states understanding that the energy uh, uh, sector could be a great weapon and it weaponized the energy sector so back in the days you, if you were basically in control of natural resources you could control a lot of things if you're in control of currency you can control nation but today if you control the energy and the energy grid that comes with it now you can control nation so that set basically the stage basically for the discord in between russia and the united states uh and also china of course uh, to 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 a certain degree and uh what we've realized in looking into this uh, this uh, this warfare this uh, kind of undercover if you will warfare is we've realized that there was an actual conflict between russia and the united states within the context of ukraine so ukraine had became a battleground and of course we were invited to reduce uh, uh, this uh, uh now imagine all the idiots the dummies on the low level that actually think that this is about the pa neo-pagan tiny mustache man ideology right <laughs> like the the tiny mustache man followers that think that it's about energy dude come on anyway go listen to that if you want the full uh breakdown of that it's really good the entire operation had cost less than two hundred thousand dollars and the cia's involvement in the coup had stayed a secret this gave the cia by the way people talked about this forever but oh, it's a conspiracy theory. Oh, it's a conspiracy. And then it comes, and then of course it's declassified in like the I don't know late '90s, early 2000s. Operation Ajax. Uh, yeah, duh. And it was, but it was written about in countless books, and everybody knew this. But even still, it was you were conspiracy theorists if you talked about the coup to overthrow the uh, Mossadegh. I mean, it's obvious though. The feeling that they could do anything. Uh, that if you could if you could get rid of the communists in, in Iran, why couldn't you do it elsewhere? So they did the next year in Guatemala. In 1954, the Central American country of Guatemala seemed on track to become the first country in the Western Hemisphere to turn communist. That country's apparently leftist president, Jacobo Arbenz, had seized the holdings there of the United Fruit Company, an American enterprise. Now, the United Fruit Company is a CIA Rockefeller cutout, and they will be present at the mafia meeting uh, with 
the Meyer Lansky and the gangsters when the CIA wants to set up the uh, Traficante operation, right, to bring drugs and use Cuba. And this uh, leads to the revolution, which throws the gangsters out, and this makes the gangsters mad at Castro. And that will actually be in this documentary. Flush with the success. Which we've covered extensively. It's in The Godfather, even. Iran, the CIA organized a revolt in Guatemala. They raised a guerrilla army, deployed a secret air force, and even chose a leader to replace our bands. The CIA's man, Colonel Castillo Armas, was virtually unknown in the general population, and his army was outnumbered. But propaganda broadcasts from secret CIA radio stations portrayed the rebel leader as the people's choice for president in command of an overwhelming force. Whoa, did you catch that? Staging, controlling, and running elections. Interesting. I thought that doesn't exist. The rebels attacked Guatemala City on June 18th under CIA air support. That support had been approved personally by President Eisenhower. It was over in a matter of days. Arbenz was driven from power and the CIA-backed Armas was installed as president. And that made them very heady with success. The feeling was they were kind of world shakers and world movers and they could probably uh, overthrow any government they really put their mind to. But the CIA would soon find that success in the Cold War was all too often an illusion. I'm going to be eating a Chipotle Gross, dude. Why are you eating Chipotle? Ugh. In June of 1950, civil war split Korea in two. The Russians supported North Korea. The United States and her NATO allies entered the war in defense of the South. By the way, I think Coleman said, I have to check this because I, I have to purchase the uh, Mackinder books, but he claims that Mackinder said way earlier than all this that a lot of these countries would be split like North, South Korea, East, West, Germany. I need to find that because if Mackinder said that, that would be pretty crazy. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, I don't, I can't remember if he says he mentioned Korea, but uh, North, South Korea, Vietnam, like the countries that get divided, you know, during these, this period. I mean, it sounds like typical geo, like British imperial divide and conquer strategy, which is just old imperial divide and conquer strategy back to Caesar, right? Um, I will link all you guys the documentary when, when we're done here, right? But, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't just copied and pasted out of the old Royal Society McKinder strategy. During the course of this conflict, the United States became alarmed as captured American servicemen were displayed in show trials. Now, this is where things get interesting, and uh, old Charlton Heston takes us in a direction I didn't expect. But then again, I'm not surprised because guess who Charlton Heston was friends with? Dr. Lewis Jollyon West. Now, I'm not saying that that makes Charlton Heston a bad guy because, ironically, Charlton Heston was one of those uh, last era of Hollywood people, kind of like a Clint Eastwood kind of era person. I mean, I know he's before Clint Eastwood, but where, you know, Charlton Heston was a big, you know, gun rights supporter and um, kind of like, you know, somewhat red pill chad based era kind of still but i you know charlton hessen probably fell for and believed a lot of the propaganda as as everybody of that time period did um doesn't mean the soviets are good i'm just saying that 
you know, he might have thought, oh, I, uh, you know, I'm going to befriend these people because, you know, we're fighting the good fight of the Cold War and we don't want to be commies. And but then it turns out like, oh, wait a minute, you know, are you know, the Fortune 100, uh, they're equal to or worse than the commies. Right. When it comes to the Soviets, I should say, because it's all basically corporate communism that runs everything now. Right. I mean, Stalin wasn't cutting every, everybody's kids peepees off. Okay, that's more of like a Bolshevik idea. Uh, and Tavistock is, you know, behind all that. So the Malthusians appear to be a little worse than the Stalinists. And the Stalinists were terrible. They're a nightmare. But it looks to me like the corporate Malthusians are even worse, if you can even imagine that. Again, just think of my analogy that I gave to like who's worse, Klaus and Gil Bates, or the guy, in, the Stasi guy in Lives of Others? Like the Stasi guy in Lives of Others, at least has some humanity left in him, if you remember in the movie. Uh, but I don't detect anything in these Malthusian people at all. I mean, they, these people are like straight up, you know, goblins. <laughs> They were shocked further when these servicemen denounced their own country for crimes and aggression against the Korean people. How can I so this is supposedly the brainwashing, right, of the American soldiers by the Koreans. And this is what's going to lead to MK Ultra, if you didn't know. Go back and face my family in a civilized world. How can I tell them these things that I... I'm a criminal in the eyes of humanity. They are my flesh and blood. The CIA suspected the communists were using drugs to brainwash prisoners. In an effort to find out what drugs the enemy was using and develop some means of countering their effects, the CIA began a series of top secret projects ah. that would ultimately be known as MK Ultra. Charles Essen knows this because he's friends with Dr. Lewis Jolly West, one of the M. Culture doctors. These programs tested various drugs on human guinea pigs. Army doctors had observed that certain anesthetics made soldiers speak freely while unconscious. This is the beginning of M. Culture, for those that don't know. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's real. The CIA experimented with various truth serums for use in debriefing captured agents, and they were particularly interested in developing a means of controlling or changing human thought patterns. By the way, I'm going to let this part play, and I have to go to the little boys' room. Not the little girls' room, the little boys' room. The Tavistock uh, mind control hasn't affected me yet, so I still I still, I identify as a boy today. I might get Tavistock tomorrow, and you'll y'all see me. My name will my name will be uh, J Nell, but today I'm J. And behavior. The ultimate aim of these tests was to create nothing less than a human robot. In some cases, the persons being tested were volunteers. In others, they were completely uninformed as to what was happening to them. At one point in 1953, seven volunteers were kept on lysergic acid, diethylamide, better known as LSD, for 77 days. Following another LSD experiment that November, Frank Olson, an army scientist who had volunteered to be a guinea pig, became severely depressed and committed suicide by hurling himself through a 10th story hotel window. Subproject 142 of MK Ultra was a series of experiments with animals to see if they could be used as delivery systems for microphones, cameras, and bombs. Uh, so I was listening in there while I was going TT, and I heard Charlton Heston say that it was voluntary and voluntary, and they were trying to create robots, human robots. Is that a conspiracy theory? 
In one case, a cat was surgically implanted with a listening device, batteries and all. By the way, he knows about this too, possibly because uh, Jolly and West would, he was also giving all the animals LSD. So he actually gave uh, an elephant LSD at, at the zoo one time. So they're focusing on all this, all this animal stuff, like as if that's, you know, it's, no, it's the people are way worse than this. In his tail was an antenna for transmitting back to his handlers. The CIA scientists took their eavesdropping cat to a park for a test run, but before they even got... St now they're just throwing in ridiculous stuff, like to, you know, make this like, as if that this is a big deal, like putting a listening device on the tail of a cat. Give me a break. Started, the animal was run over by a taxi. Despite occasional setbacks, like the death of Frank Olson, the MK Ultra experiments continued until 1975. Can you believe that this is a mainline documentary with Charlton Heston basically just telling you everything? <laughs> this is just like everything in this documentary, if you pay attention, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Okay, that's this, and this connects to this. And if you know a little bit about this, this documentary is pretty much admitting everything. I mean, isn't that wild? Uh, and it's exactly as revel this is more revelatory than the other one we watched, right? The one from a couple nights ago about, uh, British, uh, the SOE special operations executive. I mean, everything you guys hear me saying is, is like, is true. I just go in a lot more detail than these normie documentaries, but I just can't believe even it's like, how does it, how does anybody think that what I talk about is a conspiracy theory? when normie documentaries are basically telling you everything I say on a very simplistic, watered-down level. In that year, a Senate investigation into CIA activities brought the excesses of MK Ultra into the open, causing much embarrassment for the agency. The CIA was feeling confident in Iran and Guatemala, but the Americans still hadn't been able to penetrate the Soviet bloc. Or had they? In 1953, the CIA part. This makes me want to watch whatever this whole series is. I mean, it's on this channel here, and I'll give you guys the link. I'm not trying to hide it from you. It's called War Stories, and there's another one called Timeline. But I mean, I don't know where this these Charlton Heston documentaries come from. I don't know if they're they sound like like old 90s era. Uh, History Channel documentaries, but who knows? So there's the this documentary. But I mean, just type in CIA Cold War documentaries, and you'll get a million of them. So it's not like this stuff's hard to find. I mean, this one has freaking almost a million views on it. With British intelligence for a brazen foray into and underneath the Soviet sector of Berlin. The plan was to tunnel into East Berlin to reach a bank of underground phone cables. From there, they could tap into secret communications between Soviet and East German military headquarters. The Berlin tunnel operation ran for 11 months, not including the year it took for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to dig it. It ran 15 feet below the surface for 300 yards and had six feet of headroom. Many of the details surrounding the tunnel remain classified to this day. What is known remains a topic of controversy. Questions still abound as to the genuineness of the intelligence extracted from these phone taps. Because the KGB apparently knew from the beginning that the West was digging the tunnel. One of is this where we get Oleg? Or is it this uh, Philby? I can't remember. One of the tunnel planners, a British MI6 operative named George Blake, was in fact a KGB spy. Oh, okay, this is another one of those co-opted British spies. It was spies. 1961 when Blake was betrayed by a defector and arrested that the CIA yeah, this is it. the truth. The KGB had known about the tunnel all along before the first shovel full of dirt was turned. Why did the KGB wait a full year before alerting the Soviet military that their phones were being tapped? 
In the years following Blake's arrest, interviews with Soviet defectors revealed that the KGB, in order to protect Blake from discovery, deliberately failed to inform the Soviet military of the tunnel's existence and the fact that the CIA was listening to their phone conversations. George Blake's safety was that important to them. And having an agent at the heart of British intelligence at the time was regarded by them as priceless. And all I can say... Again, this just reminds me of uh, Spy Who Came In From The Cold. So if you've not watched that movie, I recommend it. And also watch my live stream that we did covering that because it's this is basically the same time frame. And uh, the movie doesn't have a tunnel, but it, you know it's basically this kind of stuff. Is that it took a very strong KGB influence to be willing to... Uh, forget the Soviet military. So I imagine that most of that stuff is valid today, just as it was valid then. The CIA had tried with uncertain success to penetrate Soviet security from 15 feet below. Their next attempt to spy on the Russians would take them more than a mile into the sky. Since the Cold War began, the CIA had been unable to penetrate the Soviet bloc far enough to discover just how immediate the Soviet threat was. Then in 1954, President Eisenhower approved a top secret plan to develop an airplane capable of flying across the Soviet Union, north to south, without refueling. The plane, designated U-2, would eventually fly at 70 to 80,000 feet, higher than Soviet missiles could then reach. It was outfitted with a high-resolution camera designed by the Polaroid Corporation. In order to maintain utmost secrecy, responsibility for developing and operating the U-2 was given not to the Air Force, but to the CIA. Is this where Bono named his band? <laughs> Or wasn't there, there's some scandal of a downed U-2, right? Is that, that's from this, right? Eisenhower did not trust the military to be secure. And it's hard to imagine, but he's the guy who picked CIA to be in charge of the U-2, the SR-71, and the Corona satellite. Um, it's the kind of thing that the military could have done, I think, and sh probably should have done. Um, but. Eisenhower wanted security, and he thought the only way to do it was to let CIA run the thing. Well, and this kind of uh, gets to the heart of all of this, which is the idea that some private group group that answerable to a bunch of zillionaire oligarchs should be in charge of intelligence is ridiculous. I mean, the classic way that intelligence is done is via the military. So the very idea that the private deep state, just like the private Federal Reserve Bank, is the privatization control of the entire country. And no, that doesn't make me a communist. It's just common sense that if zillionaires run all this stuff, it's going to be the tool of the zillionaires to screw everybody. And that's exactly what it is. And that's who runs our country, and that's who runs the world now, almost. So it's not that we have some sort of idealistic, silly idea on my side of things like, oh, so you think that, uh, you know, none of this should even exist and that's just unrealistic. No, it just, just doesn't make sense that all of this is run by some private, uh, unaccountable, you know, above law group that answers only to zillionaire oligarchs. That's just crazy. And it's just like, obviously breeds ridiculous level corruption but it's the model of the round table groups and the and the you know, steering committees of the british empire which is not really the british empire it's run by the rhodes milner right society of the elect model that's the model that is set up here do you understand that's how the world really works And it's not that, oh, you just don't want rich people running things because you're a commie. No, they're Malthusian. 
It's not even because they're rich. It's because they have an oligarchic, Malthusian, anti-human, anti-natalist philosophy. That's the problem. CIA estimated they could safely fly the U-2 over Russia for two years before the Russians would be able to detect the plane and shoot it down. But it's now clear that the Soviets tracked the first flight and every one after that. Khrushchev knew it was overflying Russia at 80,000 feet. We had announced that the height that that, that plane could... So now I'm trying to figure out why Bono and all the, why they come up with this name. What's the origin of the name of the band? Let's see. History. Paul Hewson, a.k.a. Bono. Okay, well, how did you get the name according to Wikipedia? Let's see. In 1977, uh, when they started up, they changed their name to The Hype. In March of 1978, they changed their name to U2. From because of uh, the ambiguity of the interpretations. And because it was the name that they disliked the least. The same month, the U2 as a four-piece won a talent contest. So apparently no, no real reason according to, I'm just curious, no real reason according to Wikipedia, but uh, maybe there's some rock and roll nerds that can tell me exactly why. Fly was 65,000 feet. It was flying to 80,000 feet because Khrushchev's most powerful missile would only go to 65,000 feet. So here was this plane flying overhead, his missiles unable to reach it, and he was furious, fit to be tied. The U-2 flights gave the CIA the comprehensive look inside the Soviet Union they'd wanted for 10 years. In approximately two dozen flights over a two-year period, the U-2 pinpointed Soviet air bases, allowing the U.S. Air Force not only to count bombers and missiles, but to specifically target these sites. Uh, this is, was where my uncle came into play. My uncle did this. Now, he didn't fly U-2s, so I'm a little confused about the storyline of this because he flew, as I understand, uh, in planes that were marked as something else. Like they were marked as uh, like passenger or cargo or something, uh, but they were Air Force planes that were flying out of Turkey and they were spying on, they were listening for Soviet communications. And my uncle actually heard and translated the first Soviet ICBM launch. So this actually made him have kind of a name in the Air Force apparatus. Uh, let's see when that was. This first Soviet's I see PM launch. None of that's classified because my uncle's long dead, but let's see. R7? From 1954 to 1957, Soviet rocket designer Sergei Korolev headed the development of the R7, the world's first ICBM. Successfully flight tested in 1957, it was powerful enough to launch warheads uh so that would be it i guess the r7 interesting r7 simurka officially the grau index 8k 71s a soviet missile developed in the cold war the R-7 made 28 launches between 57 and 61. And that led to Sputnik. Design work began at Kalin Kaliningrad in Moscow. I'm trying to see where, where it was first launched from. 
the R1 was a copy of a German V2. That's interesting. The first strategic missile unit became operational in February 59 at Plisetsk in the northwest of the USSR. 15th of December, the R-7 missile was tested for the first time. And that perhaps... That might have been what my uncle heard. Uh, I'm guessing that's it. Total service was limited to more than 10 nuclear armed missiles. And then it says, besides the cost, the te the system faced challenges with the U-2 flights, the huge R-7 launch. Yeah, I don't. That's what I don't get about the U-2 thing. Is that because, as I understand, it was not the U-2 that first under the uh, the first uh, uh, heard this it was a covert flight from turkey anyway just a little bit of that interesting story but the americans did not hold their advantage for long in 1957 the russians stunned the west with two demonstrations of technological strength i'm not russian i'm american i'm scotch english i told you that my Clan is Clan Scott and Clan Maxwell in the last stream. I'm not Russian. In August, they successfully fired their first long-range intercontinental missile. And two months later... That's it. That's what my uncle overheard. They launched Sputnik, the first satellite into space. It was immediately apparent to the CIA that a country capable of launching a rocket into space was more than capable of shooting down a U-2. The flights were halted temporarily. The U-2 flew only sporadically over the next three years. Now, maybe I misunderstood and uh, my uncle was involved in the U-2 and then he also flew the Turkey missions. Maybe that's because I, I don't know. that They told me this when I was like 30 uh, years after my uncle had been dead. So I didn't, I didn't even know any of this until I was like into my adult era my uncle had been dead for like i don't know already been dead for 10 years but yeah fascinating stuff so cold war cold war tales baby then on may day 1960 what is the real story of january 6th what man what is the real story down the americans thinking the pilot francis gary powers had been killed called the flight a weather plane that went astray. A weather balloon! <laughs> but the Soviets had the CIA pilot in hand and displayed him to the world in a show trial. The CIA had been caught red-handed. An embarrassed American president was forced to take responsibility for this spy flight, and the Russians scored a major propaganda coup. Power's ill-fated mission brought a halt to the U-2 flights over Soviet airspace. Plausible deniability had sounded good in theory, but when the chips were down, it hadn't worked. The idea was to uh, keep Eisenhower from having to admit that he had approved the flight. Well, eventually Eisenhower himself made the decision that he was going to admit that he'd done it and be honest with the world and with the American people plausible deniability if it didn't die with the all right this is kind of boring i'm going to skip over here to jfk because this is where it starts to get interesting again this is all put his opponent richard nixon in a difficult position as i yeah i couldn't believe this documentary actually talks about uh the mafia angle and all that it's pretty wild but i mean they just talk about the silly stuff with castro that they wanted to have a exploding conch and exploding cigars, which is all ridiculous to me, but they do talk about the recruiting of the Cuban uh, exiles and uh, the deal that they the CIA wanted to make with the mafia. Now he's not talking about JFK, but but wait a minute. So if the CIA is admittedly making a deal with the mafia, contra Castro. Well, that suggests other deals, doesn't? It? Of course. Powers, vice president, Nixon was privy to CIA reports which proved there was no missile gap. Oh, wait a minute. So the missile gap thing was made up and fake. Yeah, exactly. 
In fact, Russia was having difficulties with her intercontinental missile. Told you, exactly. System. But this information was top secret, and Nixon couldn't use it to rebut Kennedy's attacks. So it was exaggerated because they wanted that Cold War nonsense. Another Kennedy campaign promise called for assisting the Cuban patriots who wanted to overthrow Cuban Premier Fidel Castro, an avowed communist with strong Soviet ties. Here again, Nixon was unable to divulge another top secret, that the Republican incumbents were already planning a CIA-backed invasion of Cuba by a force of exiles. Kennedy won the election, but both of these issues would soon come back to haunt him. The CIA had begun training a lot of Cuban exiles in Central America, uh, the theory that they would go back to Cuba and, and overthrow Castro. And uh, Kennedy inherited this expedition. It's not something he would have initiated himself, but he was, in a sense, trapped by it. On April 16, 1961, less than three months after Kennedy took office, a brigade of CIA-backed Cuban exiles prepared to invade Cuba. The plan called for a military-style landing at the Bay of Pigs. But when preliminary bombings raised an outcry in the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson demanded the attack be canceled. That hesitation would prove fatal. Adlai Stevenson just really wrecked it by saying, you know, I'm here at the United Nations giving out this information on my word, and you're doing something else makes me look like a liar. We're going to have to change things so you don't fly that second flight of airplanes. So President Kennedy stood down our second flight of airplanes. There wasn't time to call off the landings, but Kennedy canceled the air support. Now, <clears throat> I'm a little skeptical of all of this... Uh, mainline story of Bay of Pigs and Castro. Uh, for one, uh, I, I read a book about it, about it that's really interesting that I'll talk about here in a second, which has a contrary thesis that, than the normie theories. But these stories of exploding cigars and exploding conch, which even this normie documentary is going to admit is ridiculous. To me, it's like, no, I, I just don't believe the, that you know, Castro is this uh, real threat, you know, right off the coast of, you know, Florida. And there's a freaking military base on Cuba. I mean, who believes this? Like, if the, it's just like North Korea, right? If, if, if they were real threats, they could at any time be dispensed with easily. Uh, and so I think. And you're going to notice there's even a, a couple places in this Normie documentary where they admit that something about this doesn't even make sense. It's ridiculous. And that's why I kind of like the thesis of Servando Gonzalez in uh, Psychological Warfare in the New World Order, where he argues that Castro seems to be more of a figure that the establishment has no problem allowing to exist and allowing to be there. Because these sort of controlled dictator figures like Kim Jong and... Castro, like they provide the justification for a lot of things in these regions, particularly U.S. bases, U.S. policing. So, you know, it's kind of the same idea of the uh, same idea of like uh, allowing embassies and spies to come in is that you can watch these people and they can be sort of on a leash. And as many people have pointed out, Castro did all kinds of things that didn't make sense for communists. Like when he worked for the banks in Angola and he guarded the uh, oil fields of Angola for the Rockefellers. Why is he doing that? Why do we have a giant... Uh, uh, why do we have a U.S. base there? <laughs> it's like it doesn't make any sense. But we're supposed to believe that, oh no, these are, you know, terrifying dictators that could at any moment, you know, nuke Florida. They're going to they're gonna nuke launch nukes you know it's just it, i don't it just seems ridiculous to me oh but we can't get him because you know we got it we're gonna place an exploding conch when he goes uh scuba diving we're gonna sneak an exploding cigar i mean it's just ridiculous 
Like, we can go in and destroy Saddam on the basis of faked intelligence. We can go in and destroy Gaddafi at will, but we can't We can't touch Castro. Now, there's other weird things about Castro, too, that people don't know. Did you know he has an IMDb? And I don't mean because he was in a documentary. I'm talking about because he was an actor. People don't know this. Yep. And he also tried out for the Dodgers. So Fidel is in three movies in the 50s. He's in Easy to Wed. Uh, uh, so he wanted to be an actor. He was he was getting work in uh, these movies as extras. He's in three movies. And then he becomes a dictator. Interesting. And you'll find him hanging out with quite a few Hollywood people. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, this is just my theory. This, this, well, actually, it's not my theory. It's this Servando Gonzalez's theory. I don't know if it's, it could be true. I don't know. It could be false. Uh, that's not. There's where's the picture of? There's a picture of him chilling and partying with. Um, I just went blank. Sir Alec Guinness. What do you know? We're down there just partying. Oh, we're we're dangerous dictators liable to nuke the West. But we're partying with Sir Alec Guinness, who, by the way, is what? Uh, Knight of the British Empire? Whoa, he's a commie. They're commies. Yeah, but do you not understand that the British Empire has always loved socialists? And they've always been close. So, like, Arthur Kessler was a Hungarian Marxist who became an Order of the British Empire and is still, that was always a, a Fabian Socialist Marxist. Obi Wan never told you that your father was a commie. <laughs> anyway, so basically. Uh, Servano Gonzalez's thesis is that Castro is uh, a CFR tolerated communist and that he's there for a reason. So interesting theory. Now, uh, other ha others have argued that Che, and I'm not pro Che Guevara, but people have argued that no, Che actually was, was a real communist. So Che actually, I think he ended up getting killed. But Castro, mm, I mean, he was trying out for the Dodgers, dude. Did you know that? Do you know he tried out for the Dodgers? Uh, yes. No, I don't. Yeah, I told you. See that? Did you know Fidel Castro? This says that he almost pitched for the major leagues. Well, he did try out for the Dodgers. Anyway. But, uh, and if it, that sounds weird to anybody, well, you know a bunch of baseball players have been spies too. Did you not know that? Football. Do you know that sports players are recruited into being spies too? Did you know they made a whole freaking movie with uh, Paul Rudd about Mo Berg? Because Mo Berg was in the OSS, and there's a whole movie about it with Paul Rudd. So, again, please don't display your ignorance to me if you don't know these things. Go learn these things. That's what we're here to do. Anyway, let's get back to... We'll never fin get out of here if we don't finish this. we got, we got to get to the mafia part. That's the best part. By this time, Castro's army was ready and waiting. Oh, 
Although President Kennedy publicly took blame for the Bay of Pigs fiasco, privately he blamed the CIA. Both Director of Central Intelligence Alan Dulles and his covert chief Richard Bissell, the man behind the U-2 and Corona successes, were forced to resign. The Bay of Pigs was a horrible setback. Uh, they lost their director, they lost their head of dirty tricks. Uh, the President of the United States vowed to, quietly vowed, to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. Uh, they lost their... By the way, keep in mind, and I'm, I'm not saying this proves that this was all baloney, but remember that sometimes the uh, greatest intelligence failures are uh, by design, a.k.a. the Big Nine event. So just because something is in the normie narrative spun and, and the stories that this was like an, an immense intelligence failure, now we need 50 times the intelligence funding to make up for the failure. You see how that works? Right, so sometimes these gigantic intelligence failures are precisely on purpose. Sort of prime position as the president's action arm. It, it was the end of sort of high opera covert action, but it was not the end of covert action by any means. Wait a minute, high opera? Interesting choose, choice of words, right? <laughs> Stagecraft. As by the way, uh, Northwoods, which is about Cuba, and everybody points to Operation Northwoods because it's a predecessor to the Big Nine event, which is a real declassified document. Northwoods actually talks about uh, using a lot of stagecraft. That is the humiliation. If you don't know that, you need to learn that. The Cuban invasion had been for the new president. The failure at the Bay of Pigs only served to intensify ongoing American efforts to depose Fidel Castro. Now, Kennedy wanted him as badly as the CIA did. Yeah, but see, I, I mean, again, I, I kind of see this like, you know, tolerated and, uh, you know, on a leash type villains, right? And a lot of these figures are that way. Again, think of Saddam. Saddam is trained by the CIA, put in and aided by the CIA. The Ba'athist Party was originally... Uh, propped up and aided by the CIA. Miles Copeland talks about it. And then the CIA decided on a different policy, not uh, pan-Arabism and, and Arab nationalism, but rather the Mujahideen model of the British Empire. So Saddam, who is an ally uh, in the 80s, you can remember the pictures of him chilling and hanging out with Rumsfeld, shaking hands. Then he becomes the terrible dictator when they decide they want a war with Iraq. Gaddafi, same story. Ally of the West. Then he becomes an evil dictator when Hillary Clinton says in her emails that they want to steal all his gold and his junk. She actually says that. <laughs> so, can you not figure this out? It's just amazing to me that, like, how can you be so dumb as to support Hillary when her freaking emails and her Brookings Institute papers talk about destroying countries and stealing the loot. It's like, how can you, it's public. How do you not know this? Um, who else? Oh, uh, Mujahideen. Oh, they're the bad guys now, but they were the freedom fighters in the eighties. So do you see how this works? Villains on a leash or villains are there. It's 1984, Emmanuel Goldstein. Cuban premier Fidel Castro had come to power in 1959 and immediately made an enemy of the United States by first seizing American property and then dispatching teams of guerrillas to invade other Latin. And I'm not saying that these people are good guys, so don't, don't misunderstand. So you have to understand that when we have allies who are these dictators and these weirdos and they're real weirdos and dictators and crazy people they're real tyrants you know they're real petty dictator type people so it doesn't mean they're not you know corrupt and despicable people but they're corrupt and despicable people that are used as allies and then they're thrown away when they pass their expiration date like expired milk you see that's what i'm saying so people never that was twist what you say. Oh, you saying that they're not bad people? I did not say that. They're totally corrupt people. Of course, they're bad people. What are you talking about? American countries, 
He'd been in power less than a year when the CIA began considering plans to eliminate him. Since the C so, in other words, if Castro is a uh, pseudo-tolerated villain, that's a decision made at a much higher level than even people at the CIA or people in the government. Okay, that's a decision made at the CFR Bilderberg level, right? That's what I'm saying. And that's what that's the thesis of Servando Gonzalez on Castro. The CIA did not wish to be directly involved in an assassination plot. Most of the And if you think that sounds strange, then think about Mao. Who trains Mao's guerrillas? Bill Donovan, the OSS. So the o Mao is an ally, allied with the OSS. Do you understand that? Wait a minute. I just, I don't understand. I thought Mal was back. Well, David Rockefeller loved Mal. He wrote New York's New York Times editorials praising him. So uh, if David Rockefeller can appreciate and love Mao Zedong and his regime, maybe he can also love and appreciate Castro and the cold warriors of the CIA who might actually not know that or actually believe in the narratives. We got to get that Castro. He's a tyrant. He's going to nuke us. See how that works? It's, it's, that's how it works. It's like that. <clears throat> These attempts involved third parties. Some potential operatives were recruited from South Florida's large population of anti-Castro Cuban exiles. Tony Montana, right? <laughs> so this is where we get Tony Montana. Literally, if you watch Oliver Stone's uh, Scarface, the very beginning of the movie, you got to watch the director's cut because the director's cut actually has all of this. Uh, it, when Tony gets here in the boats, he's trying to get away from uh, Castro people because he can't stand Castro. And he's worried about Castro people in the refugee camps coming after him. Remember that? But the exiles were infiltrated by members of Castro's secret police. Exactly. By That's at the beginning of Scarface. Agents officers from the Soviet bloc. Plots against Castro were compromised before they left the United States. Mongoose, the CIA codename for the government-wide operation to overthrow Castro, came under the personal direction of Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. Now this is where it gets a little silly, right? So Operation Mongoose is these ridiculous plots to kill Castro, which are just cartoonish. I mean, they don't even, they sound really, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna blow him up with a cigar. We're gonna put a conch shell out that he'll pick up. What? Right, I mean, and listen to the guy explain it, and even he thinks it's ridiculous. Richard Helms, the CIA's new deputy director for plans, found himself under intense pressure from the White House. Both uh, President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were obviously very upset by the Bay of Pigs failure. And I haven't any doubt that uh, they decided that they were gonna do everything they possibly could to get even with Castro. Bobby Kennedy pushed very hard. There wasn't any doubt about it, just as hard as he could. But uh, there were limits to how fast one can do this kind of thing. Some of the more imaginative plans to kill Castro bordered on the ludicrous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if Charles Ness is telling you that it's ludicrous. They tried to put uh, poisons on a cigar to give uh, Castro so he would smoke a cigar that would kill him. They wanted to uh, plant an exploding seashell off the coast of Cuba in the hopes that Castro, as a skin diver, would pick it up. Why they thought Castro would pick up that particular shell was never clear. I, I'm, and there another one that mentions this. There's another one that mentions exploding cigar, too. By the, by the way, this doesn't mention uh, Northwoods, which is interesting because this documentary is probably made before uh, Northwoods was declassified. Because I think, isn't it Bamford that first mentions the declassification of Northwoods? So Operation Northwoods is declassified. Uh, when when is that declassified? Ninety <clears> two. <throat> uh, 
Yeah. So, but I have no idea when this documentary was made. So, I didn't realize it was that early. Anyway, but if you don't know about Northwoods, I mean, this is, you, you should know about it. This is like 101 for this kind of research. But Northwoods includes a lot of stagecraft. Uh, and it also includes, as you may or may not know, things very close to the events of the Big Nine Day. Interesting. So why why does this March 1962 L.L. Lemnitzer, who, by the way, was also the Supreme Commander of NATO, uh, why does this uh, fake flag document full of, you know, Big Nine style events, why is this uh, popping up in the 1960s? Hmm, hmm. So, in other words, Big Nine style events were known about in the 1960s including even flying planes into things, including stagecraft. And yeah, this is real. For you people who don't know anything, yes, Northwoods is a real document. Another plan involved sprinkling thallium salts into Castro's shoes, which were expected to make his beard fall out and destroy his charisma. <laughs> what? Sprinkled thallium salts into his shoes to make his beard fall out to lose his charisma. I mean, if you're going to put poison in his shoes, you would just, why wouldn't you just kill him? I mean, this is ridiculous. So, now this is getting a little more believable here. And notice what we see here with Momo, Sam Giancana. Still another plan had the CIA enlisting the help of the American mafia in oh. the Castro. There we go. The Dons were more than happy to accept the contract. Castro's revolution had brought a halt to their gambling operations in Havana and driven them out of Cuba. But getting to Castro would prove difficult. At least... Yeah, so uh, maybe the CIA also reached out to the mob for other hits. By the way, my interview with uh, the most famous living gangster should be coming out pretty soon. And it's not even on my channel. It'll be on his channel. So look for that in the coming uh, next week or two. One expedition of mafia-backed Cuban expatriates disappeared soon after landing in Cuba. As each plan failed or was discounted as impractical, the CIA and the Kennedy brothers became more determined to get rid of the Cuban dictator. The most ominous effect of the Bay of Pigs episode was that it made the Russians bold. And I want to remind you guys too that we have a, uh, we still have more to this documentary, but uh, if you've not made use of the best source for supplementation out there, which is chalk.com, I highly recommend going over to chalk.com and getting a hold of some of the Tonkat Ali. Tonkat Ali is proven in peer review research to boost testosterone. I take Tonkat on a uh, regular basis. So I highly recommend you head on over there and get your own Tonkat and also <clears throat> use the promo code J50. That's J A Y 50, J A Y 50 to get 50% off. And you're going to want to have it coming on a monthly basis. In fact, Chalk has it set up to where you can have a recurring subscription. That's an even better discount. Use the promo code J53LIFE. That's J53LIFE. 53% off, and you will get chalk coming to you on a regular basis. <clears throat> now, they don't just have testosterone-boosting stuff like Tom Cattalee. They also have Irish moss, which is great for uh, mineral deficiency. So, ladies, if you have hormone mineral uh, issues, you can supplement with the Irish moss. There's also Seven Wonders. So, we're talking about, like, some of the best mushrooms available. Non-drug mushrooms, but mineral rich mushrooms that's what seven wonders is great for there's action 2.0 which is great for boosting your energy levels they also have stacks for men and for women so you can uh if you want to experiment go ahead and just pick a stack for men pick a stack for women <clears throat> and test out what they send you and i think you're going to be happy with those products uh, we've been using chalk now for going on a year and a half almost two years so we love chalk they are our show sponsor. Also want to remind you guys too that you can get my red book, which is 660 pages of all my geopolitical writings and essays, all the philosophical essays in one book, 
all the theological essays, all in one big fat book, 660 pages. It is not available on Jeffrey Bezos' website. It is only available in the shop at jasonalysis.com. And yes, every copy of my book is signed. So everybody always asks, well, will I get signed copies? Anything you buy from the website is signed, period. Esoteric Hollywood, still available, one and two. Meta Narratives, still available, always available. Jamie's Books, also available in the website shop. And uh, there's some other courses that are standalone courses. If you don't want to subscribe to the website, uh, you don't want that recurring subscription, you just want a one-time purchase of the philosophy uh, uh, of Plato, one-time purchase of the philosophy, or excuse me, of the uh, Tragedy and Hope series, uh, you can still get that on the cheap in the shop at the website. Also, be sure and subscribe to me on Rockfin. We've been uh, adding uh, new and unique content to Rockfin as well. And people say, what's the advantage of your website versus Rockfin? There's pros and cons either way. Some stuff goes up quicker to Rockfin, but there's old and archived content that is not yet on Rockfin at the website. So there's pros and cons either way. Um, and you just have to figure out what you want to do. But uh, both are good. And if you subscribe to Rockfin, the advantage is that you get access to everybody. So I'm not just talking about the free content. There's a ton of free content on Rockfin, not just for me, but also from a lot of great creators like Richard Grove, uh, like Sam Tripoli, like Jason Burmes. But you can also subscribe to Rockfin paid content and you get access to everybody's paid content. So it's a really unique kind of genius model over at Rockfin and uh, we're big fans of them. Um, they're big supporters as well. So be sure and sign up on rockfin.com. And, um, but if you do sign up on Rockfin, be sure and subscribe to Grand Theft World. That's our sister podcast over there with our friend Richard Grove and our buddy Tony Richards, co host. So be sure and subscribe uh, to Grand Theft World. Also, look forward to uh, upcoming discussions that we're going to have this week with our buddy Frank over at Quite Frankly. And our other new uh, co sponsor with Richard is Scott Mannion. So if you've not checked out Scott's channel, uh, I've been um, enjoying him and his content. It's new stuff. We're going to be doing a uh, unique history of Albion, the true history of Albion and Great Britain. And if you guys uh, saw the the uh, very popular streams that we did on the space trilogy of C.S. Lewis, you know C.S. Lewis in the third volume was really grasping for and, and, and desiring the true history of Albion. Not this uh, Saxe Coburg Gotha uh, stuff with Charles, but the real history of Albion, and that's what the novel's about. And and we see the figure of Merlin in the novel as symbolic of that. And so you know Scott is really into true British Anglo history, and that's really cool. That's something that needs to be recovered. Uh, not this uh, you know. Romanian, nothing against Romanians, but we don't want this uh, Romanian sex Kobler Gotha stuff. We want the true history of Albion, uh, and you can check out Scott. We'll be doing that now. He, we haven't done that yet. He and I are going to do that, but he's really he's really into into the reinterpretation of Anglo-Saxon history, and he's done some uh, high-level interviews with uh, our buddies like. Uh, uh, Paul Joseph Watson, he's done an uh, interview with uh, me. He's done an interview with uh, Jonathan Pajot. So there's some really, he's got, he's had uh, Count Dankula on. So some really high tier content over there with our buddy Scott Mannion. And I put his links into the show description. So subscribe to him, subscribe to Richard. Uh, you know, we really do have like the best high tier content co-creators out there that's uh, scott's channel is right there if you're looking oh i gotta put it up on the screen excuse me if you're looking for this kind of uh, content head on over there to scott's channel uh and be sure and head on over to rockfin grand theft auto richard grove and also uh be sure and get your tickets to our live event in la so I don't know what people are. People not interested in live events? Do they, is are you all scared of Koof? What the heck? That's all a bunch of uh, uh, dead and gone, baby. Koof dead and gone. So your fears should be dead and gone. That means it's time to go out to live events. 
and you shouldn't have been afraid anyway. Well, go ahead and get your tickets because if you've ever seen Jamie Kennedy, if you've ever seen Randy Meeks, you ever seen Scream? Well, he's going to be doing a stand-up at our live event. He's the headliner. Be sure and get your tickets right there to our live event. And um, good news too, Father Deacon Ananias will also speak at this event, Dr. Ananias. He will be, what the heck is this? Tullahoma. Why would you think I'm in Tullahoma? I don't, I've never been to Tullahoma. don't even know what that is. So, if you head on over to the events right here, I want to see the event. Get your tickets for July 6th. July 6th, right here. Boom. See that? And I have to add uh, FDA as a speaker. He's going to speak on technocracy and manufacturing consent. So FDA will be giving a brief talk on that. He's done some papers on this. Jamie Hanshaw will be doing a talk on esoteric Hollywood. I will be doing a talk on the meta narratives philosophy text. Jamie Kennedy will be doing stand up as the headliner. So how could you not want to come to this? By the way, everybody knows our events are like basically parties. So get your tickets. It's not expensive. Los Angeles, July 6, 2 to 7:30. July 6, 2 yeah, 2 p.m. to 7:30 p.m. And tickets are 45 bucks and you get access to cool stuff. You can't beat that. Come on, get your tickets, dude. Are you in LA? Are you in uh, Hollywood? You in Malibu? You in uh, uh you over in Compton? We'll get your tickets. That's all I'm saying right now. All right, where are we at? Welcome to today's side quest. No, that's not right. This one. Let's get back to this. Uh, we got a couple of super chests. Uh, Emiliana. Emilia, $5. Thank you for your content, Jay. You helped me. I, my husband and I convert to orthodoxy two years ago. Hey, that's cool. Welcome to uh, two years later. Hopefully, hopefully it's been good for you. BMX 1966, longtime supporter, super chatter. 20 bucks and says, awesome, great stuff. Thank you. By the way, if you do want to support, do so via the Super Chat function. Super Chats are right there, baby. Right there via Streamlabs. Anonymous, $13.33. Send in that curse number. Have you ever gone over the gate program? It was used to seek out special individuals. Well, I guess I'm special then because I was in the gate program. And y'all can call me Special Ed if you want to. But uh, I have talked about it. And I've talked about it being, I think, a UN-connected thing. But that's the extent of our going over it. Um, it was very New Agey. Uh, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, I think, people thinking that, oh, this is preparing people for, you know, leadership in the coming New Age type of where we're going, right? So, yeah, I've talked about it. But beyond that, you know, I mean, I think that's what it was about. Varela second, $10.00. Sometime I would like to see you take on the brand of nihilism from Brett Stevens at America.org. His book is Nihilism, Philosophy Based Nothingness and Eternity. Uh, I've heard of this book. I've heard him do two interviews. Um, I don't know what, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think at one time somebody mentioned maybe three years ago, do a debate with this person. Uh, I don't think I ever reached out specifically to him i might have messaged him on twitter i don't i don't remember maybe i didn't um but i i don't recall there being much of an interest in a debate but i would be open to having a debate with this person meta ninja is five dollars why did you start streaming do a video about your origin story well, I mean, we've done probably a hundred interviews where I cover how I got interested in these topics. So I'm going to spare everybody with telling that story once again, not being uh, rude or mean to you, Meta Ninjas, I appreciate the $5, but it's really something that we've recapped probably literally a hundred times. So uh, not going to bore everybody with that story all over again. Surplus guy, $20, do a, li a day in the life of Jay. Again, also not that interesting. So I wake up, I make coffee, I read. And I do the website stuff. 
that's a lot of the days. So <laughs> I wish I could tell you that it was some exciting thing, but it's kind of boring. I can't understand how you do the reading and study and the videos in a 24 hour day. I mean, if this was your, if it's your job and your, your income, I mean, you, you, if you're your own boss, then you pretty much do this all day long every day. So that's how it works. But thank you for that. Insane Australian dingo marriage and partners in heaven and the new earth. Um, I think you will know and everybody will remember who their marital partners were. Sure. Uh, I don't know that everything about marriage functions the same way, particularly procreation and whatnot in the eschaton, but we will still be the same people that we are. Day Jire, $10. This is for your grok and pea plies. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Everybody remembers our riffing that we did on Rotor. And um, that was my third, second, third foray into riffing. So I'm trying to, you know, I have a lot of things I like to do. You know what I mean? So we don't just cover geopolitics and philosophy. We cover a lot of things. We do a lot of different types of things. And... I really enjoy doing, you know, the comedic stuff. To me, that's the most fun. Uh, that doesn't bring in all the money, and it doesn't bring in the biggest views and clicks. But we don't do everything over here just for views and clicks. You know, we do things also because we like to do them. You know, we we uh, we enjoy doing movie breakdowns because we've always done it, and we're not going to stop doing it, even if it doesn't get, you know, a geopolitical stream. The Aldous Huxley stream's got like twenty five thousand views each, right? Uh, last, uh, well, we hosted Lord Voldemort and we covered the out of sex thing. And I got a hundred thousand views, the doors of perception one, not the last one, the one before the last one, like two weeks ago. Right. So we don't just do stuff just for clicks and for the, the numbers we do it cause we enjoy it, but we also do some other things for clicks. So, so thank you for that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the, the riffing. I think my riffing has got, I think I've leveled up. I was a little nervous the first riffing when we did Plan 9 from Outer Space, but it came out okay. And then we tried Eternal Evil, and it came out okay. But I feel like I did a lot better. P people seem to really enjoy Rotor uh, as, you know, kind of got next level. So, you know, I'm working my, I'm, I'm practicing my riffing skills, working our way up. And I'll, maybe one day I'll kind of be uh, uh, edging my way up there towards a, uh, you know, Mike Nelson level or something. We'll see. We'll see. We do what we do because it's fun. Premier Nick. I like to do bad things. <laughs> right. What does Letarian say? It's fun to do bad things. Peter Khrushchev decided Kennedy was weak and stepped up. Ah. Uh, the beginning. A guy is screaming at me. Wow. Pressure by sending more arms to Cuba. Then, in another act of Soviet belligerence, the Berlin Wall went up, seemingly overnight. The reports came in, they're building a wall. Is that, is that, I just realized, is that that horrible John Mellencamp song? Let the wall come tumbling down. Is that one of those CIA Cold War songs? I mean, I don't listen to John Mellencamp. I can't stand John Mellencamp. Suck it on till it dies. Outside to taste the freeze. Oh yeah, life goes on. <coughs> <coughs> See, my body physically reacts against me if I try to sing John Coomer Mellencamp songs, right? But but you know you know this that song. Winds of Change. Take me to the magic of the moon. That's a CIA song. Literally, the CIA was behind them going, is that Scorpions? Going and playing at the wall. And we, we talked about that for ages. And then, like, The Guardian does a podcast on it or talks about it 10 years after we talked about it. Did you see The Guardian did an article about uh, spies in the occult <laughs> like 10 years late it's like dude uh, hello I wrote Esoteric Hollywood like 10 years ago not 10 years ago 8? no where are we at now? 
16, yeah, seven years ago. Dang, Esoteric Hollywood 1 is like seven years old now. And The Guardian just now writing articles about, Did you know there's a connection between spies and the occult? Right in the middle of the city. Why are they doing this? Well, we didn't understand Lenin's famous saying, people must not be allowed to vote with their feet. You cannot leave communism. You can't walk out. October 1962, a CIA spy in Cuba reported something strange going on in the Cuban countryside. By the way, the Oleg Pinkovsky stuff is in the Benedict Cucumber Snatch movie, The Courier, which we covered in the live stream. If you want a bigger breakdown of that, go watch my breakdown of The Courier. His report prompted a U-2 flyover of the island. Photographs from this and subsequent flights revealed what the CIA believed were missile sites under construction. CIA analysts checked the photographs against the manual of the Russian SS-4 medium-range missiles Penkovsky had given them. In the manual was a diagram which showed exactly what a completed missile firing position should look like. By comparing the diagram with the U-2 photographs, the CIA was able to determine that it would be several days before the missiles could be ready for firing. This information gave President Kennedy the time he needed to decide his strategy and to confront and face down Khrushchev. Pankovsky's manual may have been the most critical piece of intelligence in the Cold War because it prevented what could have been a catastrophic overreaction by the United States. The CIA's U-2 spy flights, coupled with the information provided by Penkovsky, gave President Kennedy the intelligence he needed to confront the Soviets in the Western Hemisphere and to force their hand. The Soviets dismantled their missile sites and the crisis was over, for the moment. The missile crisis had passed, but Operation Mongoose, the plan for the removal, one way or another, of Premier Fidel Castro, remained the CIA's top priority. The agency, at the urging of Robert Kennedy, continued to shop for assassins. They believed they'd found one in Rolando Cobela, a Cuban major with access to Castro. In the fall of 1963, a high-level CIA staff officer met with Cobela in Paris. Cobela was willing to kill the dictator as part of a coup d'etat. The Cuban asked, for snipers' rifles and poisons. He also requested a personal meeting with Robert Kennedy, the president's brother. That request was denied. Another meeting was set for the following month. Another By the way, I thought we didn't uh, engage in assassinations. I, I thought that's what bad guys do, right? We're, are, are, we're, are we good guys and we're moral and we don't do that? We also don't do SEX entrapment, right? Or do we? Because uh, in the last uh, episode, we saw the British using thoughts to entrap uh, Senator Vandenberg. November 22nd, Kubela met with a CIA case officer who offered him a pen capable of injecting poison with instructions to stick it into Castro at his first opportunity. Well, this Castro, just he's just like... Uh... Uh, Rasputin, isn't he? Like, no matter what you do, like, you just, he's just untouchable and interesting. Cabela refused the weapon, but asked that the right... Didn't uh, Chevy Chase go hang out with Castro, too? <laughs> ...be smuggled into Cuba for him. On the day that meeting took place in Paris, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Speculation arose in some corners of Washington that Cubella was a double agent actually working for Castro. Some senator got the idea that because a CIA man was in touch with Cubella on the day that Kennedy was assassinated, he had something to do with the assassination. That's nonsense. And the conversation that he had, this man had with Cubella had nothing to do with assassinating Castro. It had to do with whether they could organize a coup in Cuba. 
This is exactly what the Kennedys wanted us to try to do. There were other interpretations. President Lyndon Johnson himself would later tell an advisor, Kennedy was trying to kill Castro, but Castro got him first. The new president sent word... <laughs> Well, that's odd because LBJ uh, was involved in the uh, removal of JFK, right? The Central Intelligence Agency that there were to be no more... Maybe that's uh, shifting blame away from CIA and Mafia and LBJ. ...attempts on the life of the Cuban leader. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the most dangerous confrontation of the Cold War. Want a lawn that looks like this? Ugh... Is that Tiger Woods trying to sell me long chemicals? Hell no. It would not be the last, but never again would tensions between the superpowers rise to such a boiling point. For three more decades, the global chess match plodded on. In the glacial struggle, neither side was willing to commit its most powerful piece. The skirmishes took place. Are we going to get up to Z Big and the Mujahideen? Looks like it. I'm seeing some. Arab headdresses. So let's see. Is this is Chuck Heston going to tell us uh, all the juicy details about uh, Z Big? For the most part, in the Third World, Vietnam, Central America, South America, the Middle East, Africa, superpowers vied for influence, prestige, and more power. For Twenty-eight years, the Berlin Wall stood as a symbol of the political, economic, and philosophical divisions between East and West. Here we go, the fall of the wall. Scorpions, right? I'm not joking about that. Do y'all not know this? Scorpions, CIA, wall, winds of change. Told you. Take me to the magic and moment. Yeah, exactly. Gotta, I gotta catch all y'all up. Nobody knows what's going on. People can't figure out how things work. Here we go. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to help y'all out. Come on, catch up. Come on, catch up now. Then in 1989 and 1990. Political unrest behind the Iron Curtain led to the reunification of Germany. The Cold War, after 45 years, came to an end. The wall had come tumbling down. Could a winner be declared? We won the Cold War. Let's not hide our heads under a bushel here. We won the Cold War. Communism was rejected. The evidence that this agency has that we won. Yeah, and what won was a synthesis of mixing communism with monopoly capitalism to give us a corporate hellhole. That's so. That's what won. In the Cold War is. Notice he didn't say what what won. He says communism lost. Oh well, so what won? Oh, Klaus's technocracy, right? Who the CIA put in power. I mean, Klaus was created and put there by the CIA. We have a piece of what I think. Oh, here's our, our Hollywood consultant, right? Chase Brandon, Milt Bearden, the two uh, Hollywood liaisons for the CIA, literally. It was the most palpable, dramatic representation of the Cold War, and that was the Berlin Wall. We have it on our compound, three panels of the Berlin Wall. We got a piece of the rock. <laughs> but how much credit could the CIA take for this victory? The CIA did the job that it was supposed to do. It had its slice of the thing was to find out what was going on in the Soviet Union, how big their military establishment was, what they were doing in the way of producing new weapons, how many intercontinental ballistic missiles they had, etc. But the American people also contributed to this. They, they paid the taxes that paid the bill. Oh, you paid the taxes for uh, all of this Fortune 100 operation. Let's see. John Cougar Mellencamp. Let the walls come crumbling down. What's it about? Is 
it attempts to answer the question of what to do when success fades. The big time deal falls through. It touches upon his fame and losing his cousin losing a job as an electrical engineer. Okay, so there's nothing to do with Cold War. Well, it sure sounds like a wall falling down kind of song, doesn't it? We won the Cold War in effect, and less because of anything we did and because communism turned out to be a moral disaster, an economic disaster. Yeah, but is uh, Fortune 100 worldview, is that turning out to be a moral and economic success? Is austerity Skittles world, is that turning out to be a success? A political disaster. And the people of Russia couldn't stand it any longer, and the people in Eastern Europe hated it anyway. And that's why the Cold War came to an end. Yeah, so we need to be under a climate-obsessed technocracy of people like Klaus. Yeah, so thank you so much for freeing us. Thanks for all the freedom. It was a clear victory, but it had taken a long time, 45 years. The best evidence of the CIA's effectiveness in fighting the Cold War is that it was able to buy time as the Cold War progressed. By providing a constant window into the closed society of the Soviet Union, the CIA kept fear and paranoia from driving the superpowers into war. The world stood on the brink for 45 years, but World War III never came. In the end, one way of life prevailed over another. The ideals of one society gave way to the imagination of the other. And now we're going to get the next phase, which is the new society that is uh, going to replace the existing society, which is the technocracy, which is based on Malthusianism and feudalism, neo-feudalism and post-industrialism and transhumanism, which is uh, five times worse than anything in these previous societies. One 500 times worse. Collapsed. The other endured. Well, then uh, I guess if what collapses and what endures is proof, then we can have faith and hope that the corporate Fortune 100 global government will collapse because it is totally inhuman and unnatural and absurd, 10 times worse than the Soviets. So we can have hope for that. Support us, like us, comment, all that, share, and uh, get the tickets to the live events and subscribe to my website. And everybody have a good night.